of conflict of interest and lobbying in relation to the pandemic spending. I'd like to rem remind you that uh, today's meeting is webcast and will be available via the House of Commons website. Today we have as witnesses Craig and Mark Kielberger. They are uh, founders of We Charity. They are here by parliamentary summons. Uh, they are accompanied by their lawyer, Mr. William McDowell. Mr. McDowell has asked to attend today's meeting to be with his clients. This request has been agreed to by the members of this committee. Mr. McDowell has also requested standing to deliver an opening statement and to intervene on behalf of his clients. This would be unprecedented. It is not the practice of parliamentary committee, nor has it ever occurred in my, in my understanding to allow counsel to speak on behalf of their clients or be granted permission to raise concerns or objections to questions during the parliamentary proceedings. Of course, there are plenty of examples where counsel has been present or even allowed to uh, has, has been allowed to speak if, in fact, they are an invited witness. But this is not a court of law, and the Kielbergers are not here on trial. Our mandate is to inquire into the public policy issues, and today, uh, today's case is the question of conflict of interest and lobbying in relation to pandemic spending. Furthermore, testimony before the committee is protected by the, freedom of the, the, by the privilege of freedom of speech. Nothing said before this committee may be used in court. As participants in the proceedings of Parliament, the Kielbergers enjoy the same privileges as members do. Having said that, I am, I am prepared to allow counsel to communicate with his clients off the record, either by text or by a separate phone line or whatever they choose to, however they choose to communicate. I see that they're both, they're all in the same room. The committee has agreed that that would be the case, and uh, we we will be prepared to suspend the meeting if necessary, so that uh, uh, they can consult with their with their lawyer. The Kielber Kielberger brothers can consult with their lawyer. Uh, we will also be prepared to suspend the the meeting if these guidelines are not respected. Uh, Mr. Kielberger and Mr. Kielberger, uh, you both now have seven minutes to uh, to make your opening statements, and then we'll have some questions for you. The floor is yours. The chair, excuse me. Point of order point of order, recognizing Ms. Shanahan. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for clarifying those guidelines. In that same vein, given that we have uh, not um, had this study uh, in front of us for uh, some time, uh, could you or, or have the clerk read out the um, motion uh, outlining the study that we have before us? I, I believe that that's been circulated to all members as well as uh, to to the uh, the witnesses today. Um, I know that members uh, have taken the time to read that, and so we will proceed yep. with, sure. with the uh, meeting, Mr. Thank you, uh, Chair. Pardon me. Uh, I, I I I would ask members in the on. Uh, Zoom to raise their hand icon or in the room. Is it Mr. Barrett that's looking for the floor? Mr. Yes, Barrett. Yes, sure. Um, so I just ask that uh, um, in keeping with uh, in keeping with previous practice that uh, the witnesses um, be sworn in. Uh, we we do have uh, that ability um, to do that. Um, Madam Clerk, I, I wonder if that uh, if that has been emailed to the witnesses. I'd ask that the witnesses, if you have it handy there, that you read it uh, into the record. Um, and maybe we'll begin with Mr. Craig Kielberger, followed by Mr. Mark Kielberger. Mr. Chair, that was not provided to us. I believe it was provided to your lawyer, but we will just uh, do that. Um, Mr. Chair, now. it was, it was no. not provided to our lawyer. It's, it's been sent, Mr. Chair. Just now. It has been sent. Very good. Are you suggesting we uh, go check our emails if it was just sent right now? That would be um, probably the most efficient way to do this. Uh -huh. uh, excuse us. Point of order. Mr. Angus. Yeah, just clarification here because I know our clerk is always very much um, on the ball in terms of um, her obligation. So she said she did send them um, the statement that they need to read for uh, swearing in. It has been sent now. I can confirm that I, I, I didn't verify as to if or not had been done before, but I see uh, the... Um, it, We'll, we'll just verify if, if the Kielberger 
if Mr. Mark and Craig Kielberger, have you got a copy of the of the uh, of the text? Anyway, at two uh, thirty six p.m., uh, it was sent and received. Uh, Very good. Could we, could we have you read that into the record now, gentlemen? Hi, Mark Kielberger. Just for the evidence I shall give on this examination, shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. I, Craig Kibberger, do swear that the evidence I shall give on this examination shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, gentlemen. The floor is now yours um, to begin with your opening statement. Mr. Chair, Mr. I for a full 14 minutes. We grew up in Thornhill, Ontario. We were taught by our family like countless young people being taught by their families. Just too good for others. <clears throat> Craig was 12 years old when he heard how a young child slave in Pakistan was killed for trying to end child labor. It was a tragic lesson that life is precious, good is fragile, and those in positions of power can easily hurt others for their own benefit. When we started a Canadian charity 25 years ago, we were just two teenagers wanting to do good. And once we launched Free the Children, Now We Charity, we found millions of Canadian kids who also just wanted to do good, to help make the world a little bit better. The charity's mission statement is simple. We make doing good doable. For the last nine months, we have sought to be measured in our comments as the good of a children's charity has been destroyed by political crossfire. Today, we are taking a stand. We have been disappointed in the conduct of all... Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Président, point d'ordre. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order. Point of order, I'll, re I'll respond to the order, Mr. Fortin. Oui, il n'y a plus de traduction présentement. The uh, translation uh, has uh, ceased because uh, it's impossible to hear because of the quality of coming through or not coming through. Perhaps Madam Claire could, could check uh, with uh, the interpreters. Thank you. This was uh, highlighted before, and the request was given to the Kielbergers through their lawyer that uh, they be provided with headsets so that they would uh, that translation would be uh, would be possible. Um, do, I, I would ask the witnesses if the, if it is possible to hook up your your headset or some mechanism by which you uh, would provide less echo. We will speak closer to the mic, sir. We do not have our headsets. It would be very helpful if if you'd move closer to the let's let's try that if you could move closer to the uh, to the uh, device that you're using. Of course. For the last nine months, we have sought to be measured in our comments for the good of a children's charity. However, has been destroyed by political crossfire. Today, we are taking a stand. We have been disappointed in the conduct of all political parties in this matter. Because what was accomplished by educators and students in 7,000 schools is remarkable and deserves to be protected. It's been 25 years of helping to build over 1,500 schools and schoolhouses around the world, educating 200,000 children, improving access and health care and clean water for 1 million people. And here in Canada, running the nation's largest annual one-day collection for food banks, creating a mental health curriculum for Canadian students. And through We Schools, and we day, supporting more than 5,000 charities and communities across Canada, logging 70 million hours of service. Community members will likely pay lip service to these achievements. They may claim not to be attacking these good works, but their political games have canceled many of these impacts and they're jeopardizing the rest. In the drive to do good, to do better, we confronted outdated models and prohibitions. Canada's charitable sector is in a crisis, a 30-year steady decline in the percentage of Canadians who give. Yet federal law restricts how Canadian charities earn income. In response, we incorporated Me to We social enterprises to create empowering jobs in poor communities around the world and generate revenue that helps to be donated 100% to We Charity. It's the same model as Newton's Own, the salad dressing and food company that donates 100% of its after-tax profits, totaling hundreds of millions of dollars to the Newman's Own Charitable Foundation. The company was owned by Paul Newman until his death. Until recent politics, Media We Social Enterprises was celebrated as a new model of how to do good. 
Since its founding, as mentioned, 100% of all profits have been donated to We Charity or reinvested to grow its social mission. Craig and I, we started young. We grew and we learned along the way that, that doing good is not simple. Not just teenagers, but for anyone of any age who wants to build something, do things differently, who tries to, to innovate for good, is going to make mistakes. And we've made our share. We've apologized. In the future, we will surely make more mistakes and we'll apologize again. We heard the American journalist, Mr. Reed Cowan, speak here two weeks ago. The death of a child is beyond words. And our heart sincerely goes out to him. 15 years ago, he said he wanted to help children in Kenya, and he did just that. He directly raised about 70,000 US dollars. And those donations supported four schoolhouses in Kenya, two had plaques honoring his son, and one plaque was removed. Mr. Cowan is right to be upset, and no words are sufficient to erase the grief that this error has compounded. Last month, when we first learned about the mistake, Craig called over to Mr. Cowan apologizing on behalf of the charity and he spoke for about 90 minutes. We immediately mounted to the second plaque honoring his son, Wesley. We're checking our records as a second donor to the same Kenya village about the same time, 15 years ago, also had a problem with the plaque. We again immediately apologized and are working to properly recognize her generous support. Working in developing countries is not easy. Ending extreme poverty is not simple. The African proverb is true. It takes a village to raise a child. That village requires schools, water projects, medical care, and more. We fundraise more than the cost of building a schoolhouse because our school lunches and student vaccines. We fundraise more than the actual cost of simply drilling a fuel and repairs to keep community projects going for years. We charity and most charities provide catalogs of goats, schoolhouses, and wells that are representative uses of funds to help donors visualize the impact in a community. We charity and most charities clearly explain that if more funds are collected than needed for a particular catalog item, those funds will be redirected to similar activities to help end poverty. This is to ensure that all essential programs receive the necessary support. We charity, like most global organizations, pool funds to help the entire village. And our notice of pooling funds for the village and directing funds to the greatest need is clear and transparent. Hundreds of donors have shared with us they understand this model and they agree that this is the responsible approach to community development. Donors give because the model is proven to end poverty in villages and all the money goes to help children. However, perhaps for a lack of experience in giving to charity, we are bewildered that one member of this community irresponsibly compared this near universal charitable practice to fraud. Certain members of this committee have also advanced a false narrative that we charity was trying to avoid answering questions. The truth is that months earlier, we had confirmed our willingness to come voluntarily to this committee to answer all questions. This was in addition to voluntary testimony before the Finance Committee on the same issue for a record four hours, more than anyone who's testified, for example, even about COVID. A week prior to our appearance, Mr. Angus wrote on Member of Parliament letterhead to demand police and income tax investigations of We Charity. And clearly showing the political purpose of his actions, he announces this on Twitter. And his letter was immediately leaked to the press to generate headlines. Imagine the NDP calling in the police for clearly political purposes on a children's charity. Craig and I wanted nothing more than come to talk to you to prove to you that such allegations are wrong. If this was about us as individuals, we would have come here right away to refute some of the very personal attacks on our integrity. But it's not that simple. This charity is more important than us, and the charity's work must be carefully protected. You see, even as We Charity winds down as Canadian activities because of politics, it continues to operate life-saving humanitarian programs, such as a hospital in Kenya that is the only safe place for women to give birth for miles. By requesting a law enforcement investigation for political reasons of We Charity in the middle of these proceedings, even before hearing from us, 
Mr. Angus knew he'd get headlines while making it hard for the charity to defend itself. And let's be clear, Mr. Workington, with respect, it's a public one at that. This forum doesn't give we charity or us the legal protections guaranteed to Canadians. Politicians are not impartial. Without recognizing our right to present our own evidence, this committee is trying we charity in the court of public opinion and forcing testimony. One member of parliament, Mr. Polyev, even threatened us with imprisonment before a summons was issued. Members of parliament often speak of their privileges, and you just did a few moments ago. So that all Canadians understand what you're referring to, the legal term absolute privilege means members of parliament can say anything they want, no matter how malicious and false. Canadians are powerless to hold members of parliament accountable for falsehood. And then on social media and conventional media, they will share these statements and these false <laughs> accusations. Over the past nine months, many falsehoods have circulated about we charity and those associated with it. Lies and innuendo have been spread but me, my brother, our families, not even our 80-year-old parents have been spared. So trying to respond to the tsunami of misinformation, we asked leading Canadian forensic accountants to conduct a thorough review to determine if there was anything improper arising from our relationship between us, our families, or media social enterprise. To be clear, no one asked us to do this, and we welcomed this inquiry from non-political experts. We provided everything the auditor asked for, from our personal finances to real estate. The forensic accountants concluded, and I quote, we did not identify any concerns in relation to the interactions between We Charity and Me to We Social Enterprises, and we found no evidence of improper transactions which benefited the Kilbergers personally. MPs have now demanded or initiated nine different inquiries relating to We Charity. The Standing Committee on Finance, the Standing Committee on Process and House Affairs, the Standing Committee on Ethics, the Commissioner of Official Languages, the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner, the Privacy Commissioner, the Commissioner of Lobbying, and thanks to Mr. Agnes, now potentially the RCMP and the CRA. We Charity believes in fairness, accountability, and transparency. It will work with any non-political agency investigating legal matters. But to the Canadians who are watching, I say if partisan politicians can use their powers irresponsibly, then they can do it to any organization or business. Consider what the politicians did to a Canadian-owned small business named Speaker Spotlight, which was been part of these proceedings. They pressured the owners to break privacy laws. When that failed, they mounted a public relations campaign against the small business. A reckless, mean-spirited attack that resulted in doxing, online hate, harassment, and threats of violence. The Conservatives, the party of small business and free enterprise initiated that. And to this day, no Conservative member of Parliament has apologized for the hate or the harm they've caused. When your sole talking point is you've got the power, you betray indifference to using it responsibly. So at the request of We Charities Board of Directors joining us today is Will McDowell, a former Associate Deputy Minister of Justice who served under both Paul Martin and Stephen Harper. For context as well, we had our COVID tests this morning. The chair is entitled to fairness and respect for his rights. If Mr. Angus had not changed the rules at the last minute, Craig and I would be here on our own as originally planned. Mr. McDowell is here to protect the interests of the charity because of Mr. Angus's actions. Although Canadian politics have canceled We Charity in Canada, in countries like Kenya, the endowment we set up and will continue to help children for generations. It will help operate Baraka Hospital, where in December, 158 babies were safely born. It will help run secondary schools, delivering education to help hundreds of girls, many avoiding the slavery of early childhood marriage. Many good people are delivering these projects. They do not deserve to be political pawns. The stated mandate of this committee is to investigate pandemic spending. Here's a simple fact. Given a chance to do good for 100,000 students and other charities during the pandemic, we charity agreed to help. That's what charities do. They help where that is needed. We didn't advise the Prime Minister and Mr. Bono not to recuse themselves. We never prorogued Parliament. We're not involved in the decision to filibuster the committee this fall. 
This is a political scandal for the government, not we charity. The government hid behind a children's charity by letting it take the fall for their political decisions. And the opposition allowed them. Not a single member of parliament has spoken up for the millions of Canadian children around the world who benefited from this organization. And as MPs, of course, you have the power to summon who you please. So let me ask you, after a year of political games, what's been the result? What have you accomplished? March is the one-year anniversary of the WHO declaring a pandemic. Hundreds of thousands of Canadian kids will once again need employment this summer. Where's the replacement program for youth opportunity? Who among you have developed a better plan to match nonprofits in the volunteer sector they so desperately need? How has Canadian youth and any of this made them, as young people in Canada, more likely to serve or more likely one day to go into politics. It's easy to tear down irresponsibly. It's, however, difficult to build and much more difficult to replace what you destroy. We charity, it wasn't perfect. But as Canadian youth and Canadian young people, they were better off because of it. Winston Churchill warned that some people's idea of free speech is they are free to say what they like, but if anyone else says anything back, that is an outrage. Just as Churchill predicted, some of you may be outraged that we point out the politics at the root of all this. If today is anything like our committee appearance nine months ago, you will make your speeches, denounce us, ask your questions, answer them yourself, and then ignore our answers. And as you do, we will think of the remaining dedicated staff pouring heart and soul into doing good, like operating a hospital at a secondary school in Kenya. So today will be another day of bombardment from you. But tomorrow, tomorrow we will return to the good work of helping children. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, the chair. Mr. McDowell would like to say a few words. All right. Uh Pardon me, that, that uh, completes the 14 minutes. And of course, Mr. McDowell hasn't been given permission by this committee to speak. We'll turn to Mr. Barrett now uh, for the first round of questions. <laughs> Mr. Chair, before beginning, point of order, Mr. Fortin, thank you. I don't want to interrupt up Mr. Barrett during his questioning. I'd like to do it before he gets on. I think there were uh, audio tests that were supposed to have been done. Um, headsets were provided. There was no test conducted. They were supplies with equipment, were they not? They, 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 their lawyer was in, advised with regards to what the technical requirements were for preparing for this committee hearing. Um, the decision was made by them not to comply with those uh, those requests and those requirements. It has made it very difficult for uh, the staff and the interpretive set, uh, to interpreters for this committee, but uh, I think we've been able to uh, to to work with it. Um, we would ask that the witnesses speak uh, slowly and clearly as uh, the interpreters do require uh, the ability to uh, interpret the uh, the uh, the words that you speak, Mr. Barrett will turn. Est-ce qu'on peut savoir, Monsieur? Uh, Can we uh, be told what reason the witnesses uh, they, uh, didn't want to comply? Or what, what's the reason? I don't think they did it just on purpose uh, to to uh, obstruct uh, the interpretation. provided with that. Ms. Mr. Barrett, we'll turn to you now for your first questions. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you to the witnesses, have you been contacted by an officer of Parliament regarding the Canada Student Service Grant or lobbying? Can someone define an officer of Parliament, please? Have you been contacted by the Ethics Commissioner, the Lobbying Commissioner, or any commissioners uh, that uh, report to Parliament? We can confirm that we've worked with uh, multiple commissioners to provide information requests. What was the, when was that and what was the nature of the communication? We want to be respectful of those apolitical, those non-political groups, the processes, so we will in, in, <clears throat> defer to them and their requests. If they ask us to share that with you, we'd be happy to, but they're the non-political branch of government. 
Well, Chair, the witnesses are required to answer the questions that are asked, but I've got more. Uh, have you been contacted by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police regarding any events uh, surrounding the Canada Student Service Grant? We understand, and of course, Ms. Rangas put a letter out to the RCMP, but we haven't been contacted in response to that matter. Have you been contacted by auditors or investigators from the Canada Revenue Agency about the uh, about any of we organizations, operations, or uh, organizational structure? Mr. Angus, once again, for political reasons, put that letter out recently to the CRA, and we've yet to be contacted by them. Are there any investigations that you're aware of that are ongoing with respect to uh, the uh, events arising from or the Canada Student uh, Service Grant that I haven't covered? Well, yes, of course, there's the Privacy Commissioner, the Ethics Commissioner, the Lobbying Commissioner, the Official Languages Commissioner, the RCMP, the CRA, the FINA Committee, the Ethics Committee, the Procedure and House Affairs Committee, the nine different groups that these MPs have triggered, and we will cooperate fully with all the various apolitical groups referenced. Okay. Um, it just... I, I thanks for answering the question. Uh, initially, in the in the letter um, from your lawyer posted on Twitter, it said that you wouldn't answer uh, questions with respect to those, but um, we have that answer. Um, at your uh, July twenty eighth finance committee appearance, you gave uh, many undertakings um, to follow up, but there wasn't a prompt reply. And then a few weeks later, uh, Parliament was prorogued, um, and then we did not uh, we didn't receive those responses from your organization uh, you having uh, felt that you were relieved uh, from from that commitment or undertaking um, was there was there any any reason for the delay in in that response Mr. Barrett, we uh, conducted ourselves by providing all undertakings in a reasonable time frame and you'd have to go ask parliamentary staff but your parliamentary staff has had these undertakings now sir for months and, and to be clear sorry parliamentary staff uh, once the committee was dissolved we were told not to uh, direct it until prorogation stopped so we weren't the one who prorogued government as soon as government came back and we had a clerk to engage with we handed over the undertakings when was the first time that you were aware that uh, that Parliament um, would be prorogued? When we read it in the news, uh, same as everybody else. Uh, and to be clear, to be very clear, prorogation did no favors to our organization. It somehow made this seem like a larger issue than it is. We were very happy to hand over all the materials within the time frame originally outlined. Um, Mr. Mark uh, Kielberger, you testified at the Finance Committee that you did not have contact with Miss um, Katie Telford. Is that correct? That's correct. On April 13, 2020, um, is it not true that you did, in fact, have contact with uh, Miss Telford by way of an email? Yes, as I said, she didn't reply to my email, but I did send her an email congratulating the general government on the fact that um, there was a lot of work going on for the pandemic, but I never received a reply. Um, did you not, uh, wh why didn't you feel that it was germane to provide that detail to parliamentarians when asked about communication with, uh, with this, uh, senior, uh, official in the prime minister's office? If you check the transcripts, uh, it was shared, uh, proactively by members of parliament that that email had been already shared, uh, the conversation that we had as part of the FINA testimony. Um, what other communications have you had with Ms. Telford? Uh, is there a time frame, sir, you're thinking of? From the date of that email to which you say you did not receive a response, what other communications have you had with Ms. Telford after that point? None. What communications did you have with Ms. Telford prior to that point? We'd have to go back and look at our records. Will you undertake to provide that information to the committee in a written form? We'll consider that. Uh, Chair, uh, I would like it to be a request of the committee that the uh, witnesses do undertake to provide that information in written form. Just so we're clear on the nature of your request, are you asking before she was in the civil service? You're asking us to go all the way back to any communications ever with her? Is there a time frame that you could put to this? The communications for which you had with her in your official capacity as the founders of the WE organization, that's the information that I'm looking for. Point of, point of order, Mr. Chair. I just, uh, uh, for my point, own part, point, recognizing a, a point of order, Mr. Erskine Smith. 
just if it's to be a request to the committee, I would like some clarity as to scope and relevance. Because I, I mean, what dates are we talking about, and in relation to what kind of interactions? Just just for my own clarity. Chair, I'll come back with a motion uh, after we've completed the witness testimony. And uh, should it be the will of the committee, we can undertake it. Then we can we can provide that request to them. Then that would be helpful, Mr. Barrett. We'll return to you for your final questions. There's nothing that we were uh, concerned. We're, we're more confused, candidly, by the request than anything else. Um, Mr. Mark Kielberger, last spring, um, you did speak about a phone call uh, with the, the PMO on April 23rd, the day after the Canada Student Service Grant was announced. Uh, that video was published. You later said that um, it was not, in fact, a member of the Prime Minister's office with which you spoke. Um, you simply said you don't have the right date um, when, uh, when asked. So um, why, 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 doesn't this, um, why doesn't this sound right? Mr. Barrett, we, we spoke about that extensively in the last FINA testimony. I misspoke. I apologize. Uh, the initial point of contact was with Craig, with Rachel Warnick. So on which date Thank did you. the... Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Your time is up. We'll now move to Mr. Sabera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here this afternoon. Uh, to the Kielbergers, welcome to the Ethics Committee. Uh, thank you for availing yourselves. Um, I've been part of the Ethics Committee, and prior to that, uh, uh, was on Finance Committee, where we welcomed uh, you both uh, to Finance Committee, so I thank you for coming to that. I, I will say, you know, I, I followed very well along the last couple months the the what has gone on, how our government's obviously helped and, and worked through COVID-19. Uh, today's, uh, your opening statement today uh, was, uh, I understood where you're coming from. Uh, there seemed to be a lot of blame to, uh, that you folks wanted to put on everyone else, uh, but, uh, but yourselves of any responsibility of, of why you're here and what has transpired. I was rather, rather sort of disappointed, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, you want to throw blame on everyone else I'm, and uh, not take responsibility for things that have happened with, within your control. Uh, so be it, that is your right. This is a parliamentary committee. We are protected by parliamentary pri privilege. Uh, and as someone who spent the last uh, few weeks uh, and actually last few years working on committees and understanding the roles of committees, we are here to uh, look at uh, many, many, many sort of issues. Uh, and, I have, and committees have powers and powers to uh, obtain documents if they need, the powers to summon uh, individuals to appear before a committee. And, and those powers need to be used, utilized responsibly, uh, but they also need to be respected. Uh, so I thank you for being here today. It maybe t took a little arm twisting, uh, but you're here, so I thank you for that. Uh, with regards to, um, and I wanna focus on hand uh, because of this, I wanna make sure we're on the same page. Even though um, some individuals may wish for your organization to be investigated by the RCMP or whichever agency, the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, and they may openly call for that. Uh, you do not, you do understand that no uh, individual, no person, whether it's a member of parliament uh, or not, has that power to dictate to an agency to undertake that undertaking. Are we clear on that? Mr. Spera, allow me to take one step. I, I, just, I just would like you to answer the yes or no because my time is limited, please. Are, you, are, you, are we clear on that? I made a very serious and strong statement, sir. I just want to make very clear that we willingly agreed to come when the request came to this committee. We were scheduled months ago to be here. It was a week prior when Mr. Angus sent on a member of Parliament letterhead. Are we clear that, I sus that, that that's a serious issue? When an elected official, a member of Parliament, openly calls puts it out on Twitter and shares it with the press. That's a very serious matter. Now, what the RCMP will do with that, we trust they will take it seriously, sir. Beyond that, we so, defend the RCMP. So, I, and I, I need to make it clear that while we all understand that, that it is not a member of parliament's duty to tell, we do not live in a society, to tell the RCMP or the Canada Revenue Agency to investigate uh, an entity or an individual. Uh, and I, and I want to make, make sure that that's on record. Unlike, say, for example, uh, when the prior government was in power and how they used the hammer of the CRA, if I can use that word, to look at charities. We do not do that, and we would not do that. And 
whether it's you know crushing political activity audits and so forth. So I need to, to make sure that you folks understand, you folks being here, having parliamentary privilege, which we all enjoy, enjoy on this committee. It gives us the, the ability to say what we, we think, what we want to say without, being, without any prejudice. So I thank you for being here, but please understand that you being here, despite what other members of parliament say, does not prejudice, prejudice you to any organization. Is that, is that clear? Sir, I, I appreciate the words. Um, what I would say is that the former assistant, you know, uh, the former assistant deputy minister perhaps has an alternative view on that matter. But yeah. I well, it. I'll ask it in this way: Do you think it is appropriate for politicians to try to direct the police or the CRA to target individuals or organizations? Absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. Now, I will follow up with a question changing tangents in a certain manner. Uh, you have provided documents, annotations, agreements, and information on We Cherry's operations, finances, and programs, as well as responded to assumedly hundreds of media questions. Is there anything additional on the Canada Student Service Grant that isn't in the public sphere that you would like to share at this time? We're here to answer the questions the committee may have, sir. Okay. Chair, how much time do I have left? Pardon me, I'm just uh, verifying. You have, a, you have about a minute left or about uh, 40 seconds left. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, to Mark and K Craig, I am trying to stay within the sphere of the motion that we adopted on November 30th. Uh, sorry, November 16th towards a study. I am not here as the member of parliament for my riding to talk about the testimony of Mr. Rick Cowan, to talk about anything re referenced in the Bloomberg articles. You folks will need to read those, much like you probably already have. You folks will need to take responsibility, whether it is rightly or wrongly, in what has been written in those and respond into those, those articles. I, as a member of parliament, here to look at our government's programs. Have you, has we and you, Mark and Craig, have you had contracts with the federal government in the past prior to the CSSG? Yes. How have those contracts been undertaken and have they been fulfilled? They were undertaken as one would suspect. They were uh, done in appropriate manners. They were fulfilled per requests and the civil service would be the group to direct it to, but based on the good work of the organization, that's why I suspect the civil service approached the organization to ask for its help with the CCSG. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Sobera. Your, you, your time is up. We'll now turn to Monsieur Fortin for your first round of questions. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. To either or both of uh, the Kielbergers, I believe it's Mr. Mark uh, Kielberger who said last uh, July as to the uh, WE Foundation, not WE Charity, but the foundation which signed the contract with the federal government. Now, Mark Kilmer, I believe, said uh, to uh, relieve the responsibility uh, as recommended perhaps by the uh, WE uh, charity lawyers. What uh, verification, what check was made on that uh, statement on the WE Foundation by a any agent of the government? that request was made it was because of the last minute during the contract negotiations we were requested to take full liability for 40,000 young people part of the program during a pandemic and the government of Canada asked us to take full liability for that program we expressed our concern this was a last minute negotiation piece that had not been brought up previously and as a result we worked with our board of directors and our council to suggest that we charity foundation which is a foundation to be really clear to take on the project we explained that clearly to esdc the government agency and they accepted to your knowledge, were there any uh, fact-checking done by the federal government as to the financial situation of this uh, foundation? 
Uh, you'd have to ask that uh, question, sir, to ESTC. We were very clear with ESTC why we felt we necessary to put the contract in that uh, foundation body because of the request to take on the liability for 40,000 young people during the pandemic, and it was a last-moment request during the contract negotiations. Would it be true to say that the uh, foundation, when signing that contract with the government, had no uh, past uh, financial history or record? It was with the WeChat Foundation specifically because of liability, but it was going to be We Charity that was going to implement the program that, of course, had very significant... Um, excuse, Monsieur Kilber, je... No, I, I don't want to uh, interrupt, but uh, time is limited. Is it true to say that the foundation, the We Foundation, had no, uh, no, no, no past background or federal experience with signing contracts with the government. So that's correct. But the reason, again, we signed the contract with that entity is because okay. of the request of ESTC to take on liability. We charity. No, that's fine. I understand. That's fine. I thank you. It's very clear. You've explained it, and I understand that. Did the uh, foundation? undertake any other contracts uh, or projects with other organizations uh, in regards to the uh, student uh, grants? Yes, we uh, ensured that there was proper insurance that would be part of the program, of course, as we shared in our FINA testimony, and I believe you were a part of that FINA conversation that we had uh, back in July. And in addition, of course, we were also uh, working in partnership uh, before the politics uh, ended this uh, amazing initiative uh, with about 80 nonprofits. Okay. Quelle est la situation? What is the financial situation of the uh, We Foundation today, sir? Require ask We Charity or the We Charity Foundation? Foundation. The Foundation's uh, financial situation today. Sir, there seems to be a problem with the translation. Are you requesting regarding We Charity or We Charity Foundation? Monsieur le Président. Je... Mr. Chair, I can't be any clearer. The Foundation, the uh, We Foundation. I'm sure, I'm sure it came across as the We Foundation. Apologies. We, we've heard you clearly now. Thank you. Uh, the We Charity Foundation returned in total all the funds transferred to it from the federal government. And we charity absorbed the five million dollar loss. To Merci, Monsieur Gilbert, Mr. Post Thank you, but that's not my question. Did the uh, We Foundation is it still currently in business today? Is it still there? It is in the process of closing down in Canada, but it is still Merci. legally operational until it's closed. Merci. Thank you. And I understand that, to your knowledge. No one at the federal government has, in fact, uh, did their due diligence on the financial situation of the We Charity Foundation before issuing the contract. Again, I understand your question. Um, please uh, feel free to ask ESCC that question. We were very transparent with them. Oui, mais à votre avis, yes, but uh, to your knowledge, was there any checking? Did anyone at No. To your knowledge, no. Is that your answer? Uh, answered every question asked of us uh, by no. ESTC, and it depends okay. on your definition, because uh, we don't know what they did on their own uh, separately, what research or background research they may have done. Vous ont, vous ont posé des questions? Did they ask you questions on the financial situation of the WE Foundation? Did anyone from uh, an officer, an employee, ask you? What kind? What's their financial background? Uh, what, what kind of uh, assets do they have? What's their situation? We created proper insurance, and we were very clear with that for ESCC. It was in the tens of millions of dollars. Thank, okay. thank you, uh, Mr. Fortin. Your time is is done. Uh, uh, to to our our witnesses. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. But I, to come back to my uh, point of order, generally speaking, uh, there's a practice that. Uh, we get a tiny bit more time uh, when the questions are asked in French because of the, uh, the time lag with the interpretation. So I just uh, wanted to bring that to your attention and per perhaps uh, uh, request a little more leniency when questions are asked in French. Thank you.
Uh, thank you. Uh, to our witnesses, uh, interpretation has asked that we that you not place your water glasses near the mic. Uh, it's just causing some additional noise for them. Uh, we're going to turn to Mr. Angus for your first round of questions. Mr. Angus. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for coming to our uh, hearing so we can finally get this report to Parliament. Um, so just what we learned today is that you are not under investigation by the RCMP. Uh, and you are not under investigation by the CRA, correct? So we don't know the answer to that question. We just know that a week ago you put on letterhead and made that public for your call. Oh, okay. So you don't know if you're under investigation. Sir, the RCP have not contacted us on the matter that you wrote. Okay. To about. okay. Are you being investigated by the IRS? No one from the IRS has contacted us, sir. Okay. What about the lobbying commissioner? We have provided all the information uh, when we did our retroactive filing and completed all paperwork from the lobbying commissioner. And in abundance of caution, we chose to fulfill that. Thank you so much for that. It's just because what we had reading in the media about what we could and ask and could ask, uh, I was just glad that you clarified that. So you came last July to our committee. Um, uh, you insisted on coming. And now is we didn't have access to the 5,000 pages of documents. And back then we had to, you know, we could believe you or not believe you, but we had to trust because we didn't have documents. So there's a number of things in there that I think are serious inconsistencies. And and you've said, you said a number of times Canada called you. You were responding to Canada's call. And that's, we know that's now not true. Craig, you called Canada. Uh, you called Bill Morneau. You said, hey, Bill, I hope this finds you, Nancy, Henry, Claire, Edward, and Grace enjoying some well-deserved downtime at Easter together, and you were pitching for $12 million. You contacted Minister Ning. You contacted Minister Chagger. You had that meeting with her on April 17th. So I asked because you were not registered to lobby. And you say out of abundance of caution, you, you, you register your group registered after it became a, a big issue. Don't you think you would have saved yourselves a lot of grief if you just followed the rules like other charities do? Sir, in, in your statement, there were a multitude of falsehoods. We did not push to come back in the summer. We were asked and we came voluntarily. No. I do not volunteer. No, it's sir, that's the well, fact. And anyways, so that's that's not the fact. The question is about lobbying. So let's get to lobbying. As a volunteer for the charity, and as you're aware, volunteers do not require to be lobbied. I do not require to register for lobbying. And and most importantly, the false characterization of what took place. April 19th, I was contacted okay, okay, by Rachel so, Sorry, sorry. No, April 17th you met. But I, I'm asking about lobbying because the fact that you're a volunteer. Come on, Craig. We're no dummies here. You guys run this organization. You're a volunteer that has a chief of staff who's paid for by the charity. That's ridiculous. The fact is you have a, a, a director of government relations who wasn't registered to lobby. You were hiring a manager of government relations. I guess that person wasn't going to be registered to lobby. And you handled all the negotiations. So the idea that you're just this gung-ho volunteer with your own chief of staff paid for by the charity handling all the meetings in advance. Why didn't you just register to lobby and we wouldn't be wasting our time with this? Sir, it is actually not possible for a volunteer to register to lobby. It is literally not possible. If you would like okay. to change the law, I invite you to do so. Okay, so that's, I guess that's why you got Guy Journal. I was trying to figure out why would you guys get Guy Journal of all things? And I looked up his webpage and he deals with corruption and he deals with lobbying. So Craig, you are the voice of the charity. You and your brother run everything. You fired the head of the board of directors of the charity. Now you're telling me it's impossible for you to even legally register to lobby. Come on, guys. If you'd only registered, you would have not been in this issue. The, the, it is not possible for a volunteer to lobby. I invite you to change the law should you as a member of parliament choose. And the number of false statements, we did not fire the board of directors to be very clear. And these are the type of false statements that we identified. And we had Michelle Douglas as a witness and she said that Mark got mad at her and hung up because she asked about the finances. That's, you know, volunteers don't get to do that, Craig. So let's just, let's just, uh, like nobody's point of order. Rick. 
recognizing there. the point of order, Miss Shanahan. Yeah, just because I appreciate it's a spirited exchange here, but uh, is it is it not uh, the usual practice that uh, the witness addresses us through you, Chair, and the same for the uh, for the, for the members? Uh, I, I I don't know. I'm not comfortable with the first name basis and and that kind of uh, exchange. Uh, that is a helpful pro practice. Uh, I would encourage members to uh, undertake to uh, to do direct their questions and their answers to the chair. Okay, so I'll simply ask, don't you think you would have saved yourselves a lot of trouble if you had simply registered to lobby with your board of with your director of government relations, with the manager of government relations, with you, Craig, handling all the negotiations, with your chief of staff paid for by we charity, don't you think through the chair, that it would have been just a lot better to register to lobby. Mr. Chair, we've shared with Mr. Angus that we would have been open to registering to lobby at any point, but volunteers cannot register to lobby. Mr. Chair, the challenge we have here is Mr. Angus has said many false statements during his remarks. For the context of the committee to help Mr. Angus with his false statements, we've posted 101 false statements that Mr. Angus has shared oh, okay. on our website. And we invite Sorry, you Chair. To Sorry, to Chair. Sorry, Chair, uh, I know they get very upset when anyone else uses Twitter, but the fact that they made all their claims on their website is irrelevant to the question, which is about the Lobbying Act and the fact that they've set this organization up, that it was Bill Morneau that the minister that Craig Kielberger contacted, Bill Morneau, who they hired his daughter. They promoted the other daughter with her book on their stage. They paid $41,000 uh, to fly them around the world. These were personal connections. So when they needed money and he writes, he, he does not deal with the finance department. He goes directly to the finance minister of a G7 country and calls him by his first name. That is lobbying. It's lobbying. They might think they're besties, but it's lobbying. And I want to that they're just these volunteers of an organization that they make all the decisions that, that they handle. In fact, the director of lobbying said for, for we said that she wasn't even involved in the negotiations with Bill Morneau. It was Craig Kielberger. So come on, Craig, why didn't you register to lobby? Because you are the main lobbyist for the group. Mr. Angus, I, I won't even see to correct the number of inaccurate statements you've made there. I will simply point out again that there is literally not legally possible for me as a volunteer to register. Because you set yourself up through me to we. Or to that you have your, your you have your charity, the charity pays you a chief of staff. And but you because you're on the me to we side, you're saying that that means you're not legally able to lobby. I don't know where you guys come up with these laws. They're fascinating, but I don't I maybe guy journal. I mean, he knows all the loopholes. Maybe that's why you've got him on retainer. Maybe he'll help you, but it doesn't come on. It doesn't okay. pass the smell test. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, apparently we have lost the chair. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, Mr. Angus, uh, but I just want to check with the uh, clerk as to what time we are uh, operating at if the clerk can text me then then I will be on the same board I'm, I'm sorry really to to interrupt uh, as uh, as members know as the vice chair um, I must take on uh, this role so clerk allow me to offer sir because we can't register ourselves we have proactively put on I, I'm sorry yeah uh, your time is up um, uh, mr. Kilberger and so now it's mr. Paliev for five minutes have either of you been contacted by the RCMP? Again, as we said, we uh, do understand Mr. Angus's letter. And no, that's my, my question. Have either of you been contacted by the RCMP? We've previously spoken on this matter. You can have keep you, asking as often as you like. Have either of you been contacted by the RCMP? We've previously spoken on this question. No, you haven't. You said you haven't been contacted about Mr. Angus's letter. Have you been contacted about the, by the RCMP for any other purpose? Yes or no? Two of us have not been contacted by the RCMP. Period. We have not been contacted by the RCMP. We understand Mr. Angus has put a letter in the public domain. Has, uh, have you been contacted by the Office of the Ethics Commissioner? Yes. And uh, is he, has he questioned, he or any of his staff questioned you? Yes. By, sta by statute, apparently, we are not allowed by, by the statute of the government. I have no problems answering this question, but by statute of the government, apparently, we're not allowed to answer your question. Which uh, section? I should, 
uh, again, this is a former assistant deputy minister of justice. I, and I he should know. Let's see. <laughs> well, it's the express for No, no, I'm not asking him to speak. Sorry. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I am not aware of what statute is the statute that you're asking for specifically, but on an assistant deputy minister of justice's comments, okay. I trust his comments be accurate. All right. So we'll just assume you're, you're hiding that. Uh, next, uh, we uh, question is, have you been contacted by any member of the lobbying commissioner's office? Mr. Polyev, you're not even officially a member of this committee and you're answering your own questions, so feel free to answer your own questions. Uh, the question was, uh, can you tell me if anyone in the lobbying commissioner's office has been in contact with you, yes or no? We have proactively reached out to the lobbying commissioner to provide uh, disclosures and information, and of course, as part of that, there's always an exchange back and forth. Have they questioned you? We have not been questioned. Are you under investigation by the lobbying commissioner? Not to our knowledge. Have you been contacted by the Commissioner of Canada Elections for any reason? Not that we're aware of. What is the uh, total dollar value of all of the fees and expenses, both cash and in-kind, that you have paid to, to you or any of your organizations have paid to members of the Trudeau family? Okay, so Margaret Trudeau was $180,000 she received for a total of 28 events. Alexander Trudeau was $36,000 he received for a total of eight events. Sophie Trudeau was $1,500 for an event prior to her husband becoming the Prime Minister. And all that has been previously provided to you, sir, in the Phoenix Committee. What is the total dollar value of all the fees and expenses you've paid to the Trudeau family? The total, please. $17,500. To the... And by Trudeau family, I mean his brother, his mother, his spouse, himself. Oh, those are the fees. If you ask me expenses, I need a calculator for a minute. If one second, you can come back to it. But you will, you will be. If you, if you, you're going to give this number on the record and into into, uh, you're going to testify it into the record under oath because I want the total. I want nothing left left out, and I want you to tell us what the total value is that you have paid to Mr. Trudeau, his wife, his brother and his mother, the total of everything. Uh, indeed. Uh, so we, we previously gave this to you nine months ago. It's also on our website. No, I'm asking you to put it into the record. You're, sure. Get to it. Yes. Or you're going to be brought back to, to do it. Thank you very much, everyone. Your time's up, Mr. Polyev. And uh, now point of order. Point of order. Actually, Madam, uh, sorry, Madam, Madam Vice Chair, you're quite wrong. Uh, and because you were in the chair, we decided to run the timer. And I still have a minute and 25 seconds left. So I'm nice sorry, try, uh, but I'll keep Mr. going. No, nice Mr. Try. Polyev, I am being nice directed try. by the clerk. Nice try. And uh, it I is have now the, I have the clock right here. Mrs. I have the Legendio. clock right here. Please Thank mute I, Mr. Oh, the Polyev. clerk has Mrs. just occurred. Sorry, the clerk I, has just confirmed to me that I do have uh, more than a minute left. She's just said it herself. Uh, all right, then I stand corrected. Well, Thank you very much. Very what we strange do, that we you... We do follow... No, I, I'm sorry. I'm taking the direction from the clerk as far as the time. Uh, Thank you for your understanding. Please go ahead, Mr. Polyev. One more minute. Total dollar value that you've paid Mr. Trudeau, his wife, his brother, and his mother. Well, that I can give you. That, that's what I said. It was two hundred and seventeen thousand and five hundred dollars. No, the dollar, but the dollar value, including expenses. Fees. We never get expenses to them. We paid those expenses directly, of course. Right for them. We, that. we we paid like the hotel bill when they stayed, or the that's right. Was coming. That's right. Expenses would have been over roughly. Oh my gosh, eight. Uh, sorry, we're doing this for you. It's so much money you can't even keep track of it all. There was forty-two events. It no. was a total of two hundred and nine thousand dollars, six hundred and twenty plus sixteen cents for the expenses uh, for the individuals, which works out to roughly. Rappel au règlement, Madame la Présidente. Mais maintenant. Point of order, Madam Chair. I think that our chair has returned and is now accessible and available. So I think you're dealing with a point of order currently, Mr. Chairman, and the time has expired. Not, um, and, and I want a point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Yes, point of order, recognizing yes. point of order, Mr. Uh, on two separate occasions, the vice, the liberal vice chair has tried to interrupt my testimony by falsely claiming that I was out of time, even though I kept time and, and I can show uh, definitively that my time has not expired. 
Uh, and uh, so I would I ask that uh, that I be uh, granted the opportunity to get an answer to a very simple and straightforward question that the Kielberger brothers seem to have a lot of difficulty answering, which is the total value of all the cash and in-kind benefits that have been paid in the for fees or, uh, fees or expenses for the Trudeau family, including uh, Mr. Trudeau, his wife, his mother, and his brother. Uh, simple question. I've been trying to get an answer for two minutes, but regularly interrupted by the vice chair. Okay, we'll we, we'll allow for an answer, and then your time is up, Mr. Polyev, and then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, we'll give some time for the answer. So, so, so I, I, again, we would never, of course, pay any expenses or uh, honor to Mr. Trudeau, but to uh, Margaret Trudeau, Alexander Trudeau, uh, and, and, and Sophie Trudeau over the past, uh, whatever, 10 plus years of various speaking Just events. Just in total, please. Get to yes, it. it, it trying to do the quickest math that I can here, adding it together is roughly $216,000 in honorariums, $216,000 in honorariums, and roughly uh, $209,000 in expenses, and then you could, which of course was not paid to them, that goes, we just pay it directly to a hotel or a flight, and if you add that together, uh, it's a little over $400,000 that would have been all the expenses over the past decade for 42 different events that they attended and spoke on the stage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Polyev. We're going to turn to Ms. Latanzio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. I'm uh, glad that you accepted to be uh, willing willing to come uh, and testify before us today. So um, I'm, I'm also a member of the Language Committee, and we had uh, discussed uh, another standing committee, and we had also discussed um, the program. We spoke a lot um, of the... Um, the uh, CSSG uh, uh, program there too. And the question there was providing the program in both official languages. So I'd like to hear you today on, you know, the subject of hiring a, a, for, a firm, the national PR, uh, to promote uh, the program in Quebec and other uh, francophone communities. So why did you bring on a firm to help deliver the program in French? So l'organisation est complètement bilingue les tournées our organization is totally bilingual in the programming and schools we've opened a uh, office in montreal to assist with students and to manage the various schools that we have in quebec province the uh, program grew so quickly and expanded that we had to hire some people to help us uh, throughout the country, but uh, also in Quebec. And we had about 400 schools prior to uh, this political situation active in Quebec with us. And prior to uh, the CSSG, uh, we had about 12 full-time staff in our Montreal office and about 16 when the program was launched. But we were asked to uh, turn ourselves into a pretzel to help the government run this program as quickly as possible. And sincerely, we needed all the help we could get. There was talk that um, that office that you had in Montreal was actually closed. Is that correct? Is that time for the pandemic and 16, um, of course, when the program began? Uh, the only thing that closed it was the politics. Okay. Does the We Charity frequently outsource work to other organizations for French initiatives? We've worked with National PR for years uh, with our We Days in Montreal, uh, L'Organisation Uni, and uh, we have done We Days for, for many years, and National PR was involved uh, with those We Days. Uh, and, and to answer your question, we also engage with uh, English language equivalent firms in other parts of Canada also. It wasn't unusual for us. Okay. And what would be the costs and fees associated with outsourcing translation or having you know, bilingual staff or resource, resources to have this program in, in, uh, in either English or French, but more particularly in French in Quebec? It was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're, we're happy to look into that. Would you be able to provide us that information? Uh, absolutely. We're happy to provide uh, an overview. Okay. And I ask you about WE's ability to deliver the program in both official languages on the onset, where you asked that specific question. We were. And can you um, tell us if any concerns were raised with regards to the ability to be able to do so? No concerns were raised. Okay. So you had already executed this type of work in the past? That's correct. Can you give us some examples? 
Sure, as contacts, we did 12 uh, La Journée Unie, which are celebrations that brought youth together from all across the province for service and volunteer programs. We helped engage 400 schools in the province of Quebec and had partnerships with school districts, uh, post-secondary, um, nonprofit partners across the province. We'd had a full-time presence in the province for a decade, engaging students. Uh, we delivered on government programs previously in Quebec that had received supports. And uh, for example, we were running a program doing a youth social entrepreneurship that ESTC had previously funded that we put out to Quebec uh, students to join us in. You know, we were proud before all this, we were proud to have been the largest youth service organization in the country, uh, coast to coast to coast and fully bilingual engaging young people. And were there any documents or contractual obligations between you um, and the government with regards to providing this service in French in Quebec? And if so, would you be able to provide us a, a, comp a, a copy of the said contract? Absolutely. We'd be happy to provide that to you. Um, and, and in fact, actually, we previously did to the FINA committee, but we're happy to provide it again. Okay. We did not receive it. So for the record, we'd like to ask you to provide it in this committee. Uh, can you tell us what the state of the We Charities operations are in Canada today? I'm not too sure if my colleague Fortin uh, asked you that question. I wasn't too sure, but I just, for the record, would like to hear you uh, on, on that, uh, on We Charities operation in Canada and uh, Quebec today. Uh, to answer your question, it is a tragedy what is happening. We September was the hardest choice we've ever had to make to announce the wind down of 25 years of work in this country. That you know people lost their jobs, who've been with us since the beginning, just trying to help youth. 7,000 schools in Canada are going to be impacted as a result of this. We're doing our best to try to move resources online in perpetuity, but it, the impact is devastating for youth in this province, in Quebec and across Canada. And there's so many schools. We used to work in 7,000 schools across the country and uh, we'll not be able to do that, providing amazing things like mental health resources. If schools in, for example, Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands, like schools like Thousand Islands Secondary School, we'll not be able to work with anymore. Rockville Collegiate School, Westminster Public School, Wellington Public School in Prescott, schools in James Bay, you know, Kirkland Lake District Composite School, Northern Collegiate, that were actually very active in promoting the CCSG to their to their students. Moose Factory. Thank you. Thank Moose you, Mr. Kielberger. Your uh, the time for those questions are now up. We'll turn to uh, Mr. Fortin. Monsieur Fortin, for uh, for your next round of questions. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Kielberger, you are giving us a whole sequence of schools that are going to be impacted. Uh, why can you not provide uh, services in these uh, schools? And keep it short, I only have a minute. Because we charity in Canada's closing, sir, because okay. of the politics. Merci. Okay. okay. Okay, understood. One or the other of uh, the Kielberger brothers, to your knowledge, did the federal government undertake a uh, uh, their due diligence uh, before signing that contract last spring. To say that the Privy Council would be the best able to speak to that, and, and he said, yes, they did. And we would trust him, and we wouldn't have... All we know is we answered every question asked of us. Well, who was asking the questions at that time? The, the questions that you did reply to, who, who was asking those questions? Of course, uh, multiple individuals at ESDC uh, asked the questions during the vetting process. Et les questions étaient à quel sujet? And on what subject or topic were these questions? Well, it's important to provide context to this, that in 2017, ESDC came, Rachel Warnick, to visit our offices. 2018, they gave us a $800,000 grant to test. Non, mais oh, je vous remercie, je sais, monsieur. Right, that's all Fair. But in 2020, before you got the $43 million uh, contract uh, for these uh, student grants, what kind of questions were asked about the financial condition and situation of the WE Charity Group? I, I'd be happy to answer your question, but I do think it's important in your previous question to understand this didn't come out of the blue. 2017... No, seulement 2020. I'm only interested in 2020. I only have a minute left. I mean, it'd be nice to chat all day long, but I don't have that time. In 2020... Documents, including our 
um, uh, our, our audits and, and the various documents you'd imagine we charity would offer to provide. Quel document have you... What documents were submitted to the uh, by at the request of government on the financial state of the WE charity? Every question, all of our documents. The minister in May 2020 said uh, due diligence, uh, further diligence. There were two, in fact, uh, verifications as to the financial situation of We Charity. Were you aware of that? Uh, we were not aware of that, but would defer to the, the, the civil service if that's what they did. In so far as your capacity to uh, provide the program, so you hired national PR to uh, in Quebec, at least. In the past, uh, have you delivered programs in a similar fashion in Quebec? In French, of course. Yes. Quel program? Which programs? Member asked us, and I repeat the same example. We ran one of the largest service programs in the province, engaging 400 schools. In, en français? in French? Yes, completely bilingual. The uh, We Days, for example, are a celebration for all students and those who have worked at least one year as volunteers uh, for their communities. And there's been, uh, of course, uh, uh, exchanges at various uh, schools in Quebec. Uh, there are training modules for the educators uh, throughout the country, all conducted in French. So why hire national PR in that case? Pardon me, Mr. Fortan, we've given you some extended uh, grace there in terms of time frame. We're gonna move on to Mr. Angus now, Mr. Angus. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think one of the things that's been difficult for everyone trying to get a sense of how you operate is because the multitude of companies, the multitude of side holdings and the vast real estate empire has certainly drawn a lot of attention uh, through numbered companies, your personal holdings, we're not really sure. And I, I was really interested because the other day I was seeing an article in the National Post and it said that one of the reasons that you do this is a deliberate strategy, and I'm reading from the National Post, a deliberate strategy to operate efficiently and avoid office leasing and rental costs. Uh, and that's the reason to have such a vast real estate empire. So when you signed the deal with the federal government, the budget that you brought forward, you wrote in $590,000 in rent, which over the course of the 100 days uh, for that period of the cohort in the budget would have been about $200,000 a month in rent. That's pretty extraordinary. Uh, why should we be paying rent to your organization when you say that you have control of the buildings? Well, to be clear, it wasn't necessarily for our organization. And to remind the member at that point back a year ago, no one knew whether we needed special filtration systems, plexiglass to, to separate mm. people. We were putting a potential line item. And if I could also share, there were 13 different references to audit in that document. And those would okay, only okay. have been used to deliver the program. Okay, because I, I, I think the idea of $200,000 a month in rent is extraordinary. And the reason I ask it is because, again, when you guys came here last July, you insisted on testifying under oath. You made it very, very clear not any money was going to your organization. It was all going to programming. And you made a big, big deal. There were no administration fees. And my liberal colleagues were, were you know, geared up to ask you that a couple of times. And you said no administration fees. And, again, I look into the budget. I see $590,000 for rent for you guys. It's not for other charities because the other charitable uh, programming is separate. And on top of that, it says 15% administration fee for We Charity. Um, again, why didn't you guys just say, yeah, of course there's administration fee. Of course that's reasonable. Instead, you, you made it and you swore under oath that you were not taking any administration fee. So we're paying you nearly $600,000 for three months for rent. We're paying for the phones plus the administration fee. Well, why didn't you just tell us there was an administration fee? Sir, with respect to misrepresenting us, we said there was no profit that was going to be kept for the... No, no, you actually said administration fee. I've got it in the record. You used the word administration because it struck me as odd at the time. That's why when we finally got a copy of the budget, I checked and it's 15% administration fee. That's separate from all the other things. And in... 
wouldn't it be easier just to say these things? Then we wouldn't be asking and, and feel so mistrustful of you. We, we don't hide the fact that to run a program costs administration, sir. Of course it does. And, and it's- I know. So why did you tell them that you weren't taking any administration fee? And why didn't you tell us that you were getting $200,000 a month rent on your buildings in Toronto? That's a, that's a whack of public money paying your uh, me to we operation. Your statement's not correct. What we said was that the profit made for the charity, any program has administration because it requires administration to deliver, but that administration was solely to deliver the program. It's a reasonable yeah, no, but matter. That's not what you said. You said, they said, am I to be our friend, Mr. Schrazer from guess, Nova Scotia? He said, are you telling me there's no administration fees? And you said it's all going to programming. But when we look at the budget, and I'm not trying to be a hard guy here. But it's like, if I got straight answers last July, we wouldn't be here now. It was a simple question. Programming is separate. It's a line item. The rent is a line item. The telephones are a line item. And your 15% administration fees, which you could have just said, yeah, it's 15%. But you said, no, it was all going to programming. I don't know why this misrepresentation always happens. It wouldn't, you wouldn't be so under fire now. Just, yeah, 15% administration fees. But you said under oath there was none. Mr. Angus, I, with respect, I don't feel you know how to read the budget properly. That's an administration fee for the program. And we said all the money was going to the program. And as a result, we were going to make no profit because we were asked by the government of Canada in record time to help. Okay, so, so, so thank, perhaps thank you. I can't read a, So perhaps I can't read a budget, but I can read that we're spending $600,000 on your rent on your downtown Toronto properties. So so thank you, Mr. Angus. We're going to turn to Monsieur Gord for his round of questions. Monsieur no, Gord. Inquiries. Thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gord. We're going to turn to you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je veux poser. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to have a yes or no, true or false. Did the go federal government contact you to deliver the uh, student grants uh, for 40,000 individual students? So the question was, did the federal government contact us to deliver the, the program? Did they contact us? Yes, they contacted us. Pour délivrer. To deliver the um, CSSG program to 40,000 students. Government asked us to deliver it to 20,000. We told the government it would cost $50 million. Over the time, they increased the numbers so exponentially it grew to 543 million and 100,000 students. But they contacted us originally for 20,000. Does that answer your question? Uh, initially 20,000, another phase 40,000. Did they tell you the total amount that would be available to distribute uh, as grants? We were told by the government that it was $957 million. Can you confirm that? $957 million which was published by the uh, federal government for all uh, the grants to students. The program kept on changing at the request of ESTC, and it kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger at the request of the government. This was not being requested by us. It was being requested by ESTC. Secondly, uh, this whole initiative in terms of this $912 million that keeps on being shared, especially by Mr. Angus incorrectly, we have never heard of this figure until it was shared in a public forum. And we looked at ourselves and we were dumbfounded because it was only up to 543 million. And I say only because it's still uh, very significantly important to recognize that was if all 100,000 youth all did the maximum hours of service, which would have equated to the maximum threshold. And so the, the real value of this program so a very significant sum would have been a couple hundred million dollars. No, the traduction of the problem is not 2 million. Well, it's 60. So, 200 million. Well, we're talking 542. If we're talking that much money for 400,000 or 400,000, that's 11,000 dollars per student. But the government has indicated that these uh, grants would vary between $1,000 and $5,000 uh, max per student. Now, if every one of the 40,000 students would have hit the maximum, that would have got $200 million. And if there was 500 
$43 million. Where is the difference? $342 million difference. How do you account for that? Chair, the, the honorable member has his, his numbers incorrect. It's up to 100,000 students, so up to 100,000 students, $5,000 up to per student if the maximum number was reached, 100,000 times 5,000, $500 million. And the remaining amount was up to that amount if all 100,000 students participated for the running of the program. But this is why I was sharing that this could potentially be um, much lower because this is how ESCC decided to do the budget. If I may also add for the clarity uh, of, of, of the member, um, it, it, so it was funds for students, administration costs to deliver the program, and funds that we were to disperse to other non -profit. Okay, merci. Je vous, je vous remercie de... I thank you for having clarified the 100,000 students because earlier you talked about 20,000 students and then 40,000 students. Now, if you're giving us 100,000 students, the numbers make sense. But perhaps you could have said so initially. You had uh, two phone calls, apparently, one from the government to uh, implement the program. The uh, clerk of the Privy Council also indicated that he called you for the architecture, the planning of this uh, program. Now, in order to establish a framework uh, for that, did your organization participate in the development of the program itself? And if I may uh, just gently clarify, the clerk of the Privy Council did not contact us. It was uh, members of the senior civil service um, including, it was led by Assistant Deputy Minister Rachel Warnick, who first contacted and asked us, based on the government requirements, to submit a proposal for how the charity could assist to implement this for the civil service. Donc, vous mettez en, en cause que le greffier... Uh, the clerk, uh, well, the staff of the clerk when he said that uh, you had participated in development of the program, uh, he was uh, mis uh, was he misspoken to when he had advised the committee that uh, you were involved in the planning of the program? Well, so I, I appreciate this opportunity. So to, to provide context, I think people think that there was a call to us completely out of the blue. So in 2017, we started to work with ESTC delivering youth programs. 2018, they awarded $800,000 to us to start testing service programs. 2019, ESDC asked us to build a white paper for the government and how service could happen. In 2020, this was not suddenly out of the blue that we had a call from ESDC. Incredibly important to understand that we have been working with Rachel Warnick and ESDC for years to develop service frameworks and service programs. Uh, thank, thank you very much. We're going to turn to Mr. Dong now for his question. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, first of all, I've been waiting patiently to for my turn. I just, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I've been listening carefully, and I'm sure uh, many members of the public and media are watching this um, uh, question and answer as well. This is not a political debate. Uh, I think, uh, although entertaining, we still need to uh, conduct the business of standing committee properly and respectfully. So with that, I want to thank uh, both witnesses for coming to the committee today. Um, I will first... Uh, Asked the question that uh, we've heard uh, in previous testimonies that um, um, by the owner of Speaker Spotlight, the parameters that their life uh, have had to deal with threats, violence against them, and that Mr. Parameter can no longer guarantee the safety of his own family. Have you or your staff had any similar experience? Yes, it has been terrible to our staff the death threats that have come into the office. Uh, and on, on a personal note, my youngest isn't even one year old and he's already received death threats directed to him. My two journalists and newspapers in Canada felt they could publish our home addresses in those newspapers. We've had the police come multiple times to our home. My three and a half year old can't play outside anymore. 
on the day we announced the charity was closing, when certain members of parliament got on their social media accounts to inflame people, someone shows up at my house who feels that they had the right to intimidate my wife. So I am, I, and then our 80 year old parents, we had called the police to address that matter in that evening. And our 80 year old parents get dragged into this matter as we previously shared. This has been beyond words. Uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, we have heard testimonies from various public servants as well as the minister responsible for the file. The public service reached out first to your organization in regards to the possible possibility of administering the uh, CSSG. Uh, Ms. Warnick said that the pitch sent by your organization was designed to meet the new parameters set out by the government. Can you again uh, iterate that uh, it was in fact the case? The, the Ms. Warnick reached out and asked for our help, and EFTC, in the months that followed, uh, evolved the program requirements, and we did our best to meet the program requirements. All right. Um, and Mr. Angus uh, keeps saying that keeps on saying that uh, despite the public service saying uh, this wasn't the case, that your twelve million dollar proposal social entrepreneurship program was accepted and received funding. Was it accepted or was it just, just pitched or did you ever receive funding Sorry, for point that proposal? Of order. Point of order. Point, recognizing point of order, Mr. Angus. Thank you. I'm sure Mr. Dong would want to bring down the quality. I have never said they received funding. I said that it was verbally approved by Minister Morneau and it is in his notes. So I think he should this, not try and misrepresent what I said. This sounds like a matter of debate. Uh, I'm sure that Mr. Angus will have an opportunity to correct the record if he thinks that that is required. Mr. Gord will just it, mention that yeah. your, uh, your mic is not muted. It may be helpful for you to mute that. Mr. Dong, we'll turn back to you. Thank you, Chair. So if uh, you don't mind, if you can answer this question. Of course, it was not accepted. And we actually had the verbatim quotes of Mr. Angus on that 101 list where he says it was. Okay. Now, though there are uh, important issues for this committee uh, and other committee to, to study as uh, it relates to CSSG, uh, you've come and you believe some members of the parliament, including some on this committee, could say, uh, well, you said uh, it literally they can say whatever they want or, um, or like a, a surreal political boxing match. That's a term I think you used. Um, but, and you haven't been given the opportunity to defend yourself. So this is your opportunity. Uh, what would you like to say to those MPs? I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. We Charity was asked to be of service during a national pandemic. That was what we sought to do for 100,000 young people. The program launched successfully. 35,000 youth signed up in the first week, over 60% minority youth, English, French, coast to coast to coast. We built the program and it should have served youth and families. And not only did those youth lose out, but now 7,000 schools in Canada are losing out from having this program because of politics. This charity is not perfect, and, and we have learned a lot along our journey, but this didn't have to end this way. And this is because of the tidal wave, the tsunami of politics that came at us. And the people who lost the most are the children in the ridings of each of you, and my own kids, and Mark's kids, and really good staff. And so we need a little more compassion in this country, a little more patience. Just a little more looking at Thank you. Thank you. I think Mr. Mark Pilberger also tried to answer my first question, which has to do with the impact on your family and your staff's family. So please go ahead. I appreciate the opportunity. It's been absolutely devastating. We've dedicated 25 years of our lives to helping young people in Canada and around the world. We're certainly not perfect, Mr. Sabara. We've apologized and we'll continue to apologize for our errors. We've certainly made a lot along the way. But I think everybody here on this Zoom call would feel the same way that we've all made mistakes. And I just want to say that this has been the most devastating year for our organization, but our staff and the kids. I just feel we've lost sight of what this should have been all about. It should have been about Canadian kids being helped during a pandemic. And I ask again, and I ask you to come through bipartisan lines to help Canadian kids this summer 
to help students this summer, just put down the politics just for a moment and help students this summer get what they need through employment opportunities and do this together as parliamentarians coming together to help this young people in your constituencies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Dong. Thank We're you, going sir. to, uh, as I promised, I said that we would break for a health break at this point in time, so we will do that. Uh, we will uh, convene you back here in five minutes, so if uh, we can be back here at 4.06, according to my clock, 4.06. Meeting suspended. We'll turn their videos back on. I'm calling the, calling the meeting back to order. We'll turn to Mr. Kerry now for the next round of questions, Mr. Kerry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank the witnesses for being uh, here today. Um, so if I'm a bank and I want to soften my image by donating to you, um, I can be seen on stage with you. You can say some nice things about me, take some uh, photos with celebrities, and you give me the opportunity to literally address tens of thousands of young kids, uh, as well as their teachers, my future customers. All in all, I would say that is very valuable. Now, how much would I have to contribute in order to get that red carpet treatment? We have partners to, I'm assuming you're talking about enabling We Schools and We Day. Uh, and so it uh, depends, but it would be a very generous contribution to the organization. And it, absolutely, we're very proud of that and we state that. Great, and can you, you don't have to give me like the exact amount, but somebody like KPMG or RBC, in order to get that experience for that company, what would they donate approximately, just a ballpark? Oh, we, we obviously we have to be respectful of, those are former partners, we can't state the dollar amounts, but allow me to state that they would be very generous to the organization. And sorry, I, I think I know where you're going on this, and I don't think we need to name the specifics about some of our former partners who are just- No, 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 I'm just saying, of is course. it between, uh, is it a hundred, less than a hundred thousand, less than a million, where would you put it? It, it would certainly be in excess of a hundred thousand. Um, okay, good. That's fine then. Like, be, because I'm not a company, um, I'm a politician, but I can tell you, if you allowed me to go up on stage and repeat the exact same thing, I get to be photographed. You compliment me on stage. You let me address tens of thousands of future voters that know that you've already vetted me. Man, like, man, that would be uh, super valuable to me. So, just out of curiosity. What did you charge Mr. Trudeau for that when he appeared at We Events? I, I respect the question. I understand what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. We vetted always the, the Prime Minister, no matter who the Prime Minister was, including Prime Minister Harper, the mm -hmm. Governor General, the Premier, and the Mayor of every city. It was always invited in, in every case. Uh, and so that same invitation went to Prime Minister Harper as it went to Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, but we did it, frankly, not for the politicians. We did it because we believe that young people should have a chance to interact with the politicians to see this as a chance to learn more about how government works. I, I understand the question. I do. I, I sincerely do. And and you know, when you know, frankly, we were popular, we had politicians of every premiers and, and, and mayors and prime minister running there. And we know now it's easy to, you know, it doesn't take a lot of courage to give us a kick now. We understand that, but we were grateful to welcome from every province, uh, from every uh, stripe of political office, uh, whether it be the after party, you know, that Lorraine Harper held uh, for us and Aaron O'Toole was there, to the celebration with Bob Canoe with the NDP, to you name it. So I, I'm, just, I, I'm just trying to put a value on it because um, there seems to be different criteria for we endorsements, like companies will pay a certain amount, but uh, if the recipient of all this, um, attention on stage as a politician, for example, um, you know, that can look a little bit different. And if the prime minister gets a certain treatment, similar to big companies, but big companies may be paying half a million dollars for it. Um, you know, people will ask the question, like, what is this charity or what is this uh, We Day event expecting in return? So you said you gave the same opportunity to all other political parties? Yeah, we, we did, uh, to the Honourable Member, we, we, we invited, um, uh, of course, as Craig mentioned, we invited uh, Mr. Harper many times uh, to come to We Day, and, and he declined. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we've had support from all political parties uh, in the past. I see. Now, um, I noticed, too, before the last election, that um, we produced a video that featured 
after where the prime minister pledged and invest in our youngest leaders. Now, for me, I saw that video very well done, but it looked exactly like a campaign ad. And you know, if you're nonpartisan, like how many similar videos were made starring Andrew Shear, Jagmeet Singh, Elizabeth May? Can you give me an answer to that? Sure. So we had 50 people featured in the campaign, uh, five zero, um, and the prime minister was invited as the prime minister for an event celebrating Canada. Uh, and with respect to other MPs, um, we didn't expect it, that to direct it to him as an individual. We directed it to the prime minister of Canada for an event on Canada's 150th anniversary. And it certainly wasn't a campaign ad. It was encouraging uh, the whole message of the campaign was used to volunteer. Um, we, we put that call out across Canada. We thought it's appropriate that the Prime Minister should be one of the people calling on youth to volunteer. Well, I just I saw that video, and it was extremely well produced. Uh, like, exactly how much did you pay Doorknocker Media to produce that video? Oh, I wouldn't have that number uh, off the top of my head. Um, it, it was certainly, a, you're, you're right, it was a substantial campaign. We had 50 people. Um, uh, we had photographers, we had uh, videographers, we had a curriculum that we pushed out on environments and volunteerism. It, we, I'm, I'm sure hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on that whole program in total. All right, maybe if you can get me the approximate amount that you would have spent on that video, because for me, it seems to be very much a political video and uh, curiosity. I guess the Liberal Party or the Prime Minister, they didn't reimburse you for any of the production of that video. Uh, no, uh, they didn't, and nor would we have expected them to. I see. Well, could you tell me how many WE events Prime Minister Harper spoke at, and did you ever make a video with him? Oh, uh, we, we invited Prime Minister Harper and uh, many times to come to WE events. We did the pitch to him and invited his wife who came to the WE days, and his kids came to the WE days, but we couldn't get him to come to the WE days, unfortunately. We tried our best. It was a full court press. Uh, and so he came to none of the We Days, unfortunately. But we do appreciate them hosting the celebration after We Day um, at uh, the, the official residence. And that was very nice of Prime Minister Harper to do so, uh, and very nice of his wife. We Sincerely, we again, I know this has become political somehow, and I understand some people may question the number of times that the Prime Minister uh, on the We Day stage, but it really was our intention just to try to get youth to serve in this country. Thank Nobody. you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry yet. I am back as chair. Uh, because we've lost our uh, regular chair. So uh, we now go to uh, Mr. Erskine Smith for how many minutes, clerk? Five, five minutes, thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I wanna start with Mr. Reed Cowan's testimony because I, I've not been a member of this committee for the entire duration. And I, by the way, I, I'm very sorry for the threats to your family in the course of all this. No one should endure that. But when I get to, I did sit through Reed Cowan's testimony, and, and just so I'm clear, he obviously is a, was a significant donor, but is it right also, I just want to get this right, he was a former member of the WE Charity Advisory Board, is that right? Yes, we had an honorary advisory board about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, in an honorary capacity, we had uh, him and, and others participate. And what he told this committee, was it true? As we shared in our opening remarks, um, Mr. Cowan, uh, first of all, we're heartbroken about what happened 15 years ago. A plaque was uh, changed. Um, very unfortunately, uh, one of two plaques um, for a school that was built in Kenya, four schools in total were built. Um, two had plaques and one was unfortunately changed. And uh, we were looking into it. We actually created a board committee find out what happened. We're taking this very seriously. Um, we, we really would like to understand and to make sure that he has all the information on this topic. We were able to re and apologize, but we of course got much more to do. What, what do you now make of the December article in Bloomberg where staff joked that we plaques should be made of Velcro because they were swapped so frequently? I know it was initially the response was that that's never happened. What, what do you make of staff saying that now? We understand that two cases have been identified um, in that same village at the same time about 15 years ago. And, and we want to research it. We want to get to the bottom of it. It shouldn't have happened. We apologize for those, those two cases. And, and, and we're going to continue to look in case there's 
anyone else that this has happened to. And it, it is context to, to give one thing that's sometimes, um, and I'm not saying and this happened in this particular case, because again, it's 15 years ago, we're trying to figure out our records. Well, rather than speculate uh, as to uh, how, how would this have happened in the sense that who is responsible for moving these plaques? It would have been in Kenya. It would have been a member of the Kenya team, theoretically. The thought that comes potentially to mind, and again, I'm not going to speculate about Mr. Cowan, but generally, is we have funding to build schools, but funding also comes in to provide teacher training, lunches for kids, vaccinations. The funding to actually run a school is exponentially more than the cost to build the school, as you can imagine. So sometimes multiple plaques are placed on a project because it takes multiple donors to run the project. But why would a plaque ever be taken down, I guess, is the part I, I just, I, I, I've tried to think it through, but I, I just can't really figure out the answer to that one. I agree with you. It should never have happened. I, I'm, it, it, you know, we made a mistake. So there is a mistake that was made in the organization involving that man's plaque. And the, one of those two plaques should not have been taken down. You're absolutely right. And that's why I called him and I apologized. We publicly apologized. Um, and we know that that's something that we need to get to the bottom of. But what is a member? So, uh, look, I, as I say, I haven't got, I haven't gone down the rabbit hole like some of my colleagues on this. I was a bit skeptical about the contract to begin with because I thought Canada Summer Jobs was the better place for it. But I, I didn't really go down the rabbit hole of who was ultimately to blame in all of this. But it does concern me when I look at, and, and I take your point, you know, this can be a partisan place, but your staff aren't partisan. And so to have staff joke that we plaques should be made of Velcro and then in the fifth estate, they spoke to more than a dozen former employees who had concerns that the organization was not always transparent with donors. What's a member of the public like me to make to make of this? Not not partisan actors like Mr. Angus, who I happen to like, but but staff and and dozens of staff. I had thousands and thousands of staff over time, and we're pleased that many of them loved their experience with the organization. And specifically on the Fifth Estate, they had uh, one example of an individual that they said was confused on whether they had funded the entirety of a water project. And actually it's subsequently being clarified that that individual was not confused, but unfortunately that piece went in the public domain and has been repeated and repeated and repeated. By, and, and that creates real difficulty for us as an organization. In fact, that, that later um, CBC put a piece on the air involving uh, boreholes. And the donors that were featured on that, eight of the donors signed an open letter say they were misrepresented. That in fact, they were very clear and knew that they were funding the maintenance and the drilling the borehole. And so I'm, I'm happy to have this conversation with you. I, I know it's obviously out of the scope and I appreciate that people have stayed within the scope of pandemic spending. But we as an organization, the money goes to help kids. We are transparent with our donors. We're not perfect. We make errors. We absolutely make errors, like Mr. Cowan's plaque. And we try to own those errors to the best of our ability and fix them when we can. What's what's the name of the individual very much who would so. be? That's uh, time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Erskine Smith. Uh, Mr. So Fortin, for, uh... Mr. Fortin, you have two and a half minutes with uh, a little bit of an indulgence uh, to take into account the interpretation lag. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Kilberger, over the uh, past couple of years, it's our understanding that you paid the Trudeau family, whether it be his mother, Margaret, his wife, his brother, Alexandre, you paid them over about $400,000, $500,000 ballpark, uh, uh, restaurants, uh, hotel costs, uh, uh, fees, et cetera, et cetera. That much has been established. When you got the government from the contract from the federal government. Did you wonder or ask yourself the question as to whether there would be any ethical issues given the ties that you had with the uh, Trudeau family? Well, Margaret Trudeau, for example, was booked through a speaking bureau. If you go on that same speaking bureau website, you'll see. I'm sorry to cut you off. I don't want to be impolite, but we just have two minutes in total. I just want to know, did you raise the issue of any potential conflict of interest with representatives from the government? Just to answer your question, so other nonprofits book Madam Trudeau, uh, banks book her, there's dozens of groups that book her every year, so they also receive federal funding, they work with the government. So we trust that if that's inappropriate in any manner, then the government should change the rules and not allow okay. her to have speaking bureaus and to do work for nonprofits. We're one of countless groups that okay. do this. Donc, je que vous avez... So you didn't raise the ethical issue. You took it for granted that the government would do so on your behalf. That's my understanding. Is that correct? 
Correct. Okay. Et à vos... I see. And to your mind, wasn't there at least uh, an appearance of an ostensible conflict of interest that would seem slightly abnormal in some sense or another? Again, allow me to point out the obvious that uh, many nonprofits uh, book Madam Chair. You can see them online on the Speaking Girl website. Banks book her to come to events. She's one of Canada's most famous mental health oh, yeah. speakers. I, I respect the question, and frankly, I wish we never had, honestly, in light of all that has transpired. But that, that conflict of interest is the responsibility of the government. And we're very transparent on how we engage. Prime Minister said he knew that his mother was doing this for us. Others in government knew. Uh, again, anyone can book her to come to an event through a website. And that's what we did when she spoke on mental health. Many nonprofits that also get government funding arranged for Madame Trudeau to come and speak. Thanks. And did someone in government at some point, at some juncture, indicate that they would have to make any ethical checkups? Uh, you know, that, that there was any conflict of interest that was potentially on the radar screen. Did they ever discuss that with you? Assume that the government process would work properly. Okay. I see. And to your mind, there was no problem whatsoever there. It didn't strike you that there was a potential conflict of interest in any way whatsoever. Okay. We were very open and very transparent. It is not Très cool. appropriate to book someone through a speaking bureau website to come to an event. We didn't do it for the sake of seeking a government grant. We did this a decade with her because she was a mental health advocate. Uh, she's a, she raised millions of dollars for us, ironically, as a speaker at these charitable events. I'm sorry, that's time uh, for uh, Mr. Fortin. Uh, on a Mr. Angus, and I see that the chair turned. Thank you. Well, Madam Shannon, thank you so much. Before I begin, I just wanted to clarify how much time I had. So do I ask you or do I ask the chair? Uh, two and a half minutes, Mr. Angus. So it's a two and a half minute round? That's okay. Thank correct, you. yes. Um, this is March 15th. This is the anniversary of Wesley Cowan's death. And I think we were all pretty moved uh, when we heard uh, Reed Cowan because you realize you don't get over a loss like that. Uh, that's why memorials are so important. That's why they have to be treated with such sacred trust. And this is then also the anniversary of when you dedicated that school to his son. Uh, and that trust was broken. So I want to ask, how soon after Reed Cowan left was that plaque taken down? Mr. Angus, this is the one thing that we do agree with you on, and fully. It should never have happened. So how soon after? 15 years ago, people are looking at the records. I, I don't know the answer to that question. We've okay. put another standing committee to find the answer, and we should have that answer. And we, he is owed that answer. We are looking into that. He is owed that answer. Because the issue is you didn't take the plaque down once. You took it down twice because he went back in 2008 and wanted to see the building. We have the TV footage. Uh, and your staff did everything they could to keep him from getting to that building. And finally, he insisted because it was his son's school. And he went back, and it was a different plaque. You'd thrown the first plaque out, and you put a second plaque up. So then you took that plaque down and put somebody else's plaque up. So to follow up on Mr. Erskine Smith's comments about staff, your staff joking about this, we have articles in Bloomberg about this. We've had Fist of State. The fact that you took that plaque down twice shows this wasn't an accident. This was willful. You sold and you got Mr. Cowan to take his son's death and legacy and, and build a story across America. And then when he was gone, you gave that school to someone else. How do you justify that? So firstly, um, what you described was not accurate, but, but here's where I agree with you. That it's, was accurate. It's, he has footage of it. We've seen the pictures of the plaque. I know you've got a hundred and some things about all the wrong stuff I've said. It's actually quite the, I love it. I'm, I'm reposting your gaslighting, but he, I have the photos of the plaques. You, po you had to go out and buy a cheap, Knock off plaque as you threw the first one out. That's two plaques. These are the allegations that are against you. 
And those are can't answer that. And that's why we are looking into them. I am I am with you on this. I'm not fighting you on this, or I agree with you. This is this is serious. This is why even yes. though it's years and ago, I've spoke to many of your former staff who say that you guys put on a show for donors. It was about selling them on that emotional tag. That they talk these jokes about donor uh, Velcro plaques. You know, it was Mr. Cowan who's asked for a police investigation. I just forwarded his concerns to the RCMP. It was Mr. Cowan who believes that he was defrauded. Um, he is an advisor, member of your advisory board, for crying out loud. He was a big fundraiser. For you to say this was one off, uh, we've seen the articles in Bloomberg, as my colleague said. Uh, you keep saying they're mistakes. You keep saying things are wrong in the fifth estate. It's like everybody. I know you, I know Charlie Angus is being mean to you, but is everyone else uh, as well? Mr. Angus, uh, you're out of time, but we will Thank allow you. for Point of order. Better. Thank you. Uh, point of order, Mr. Polyev. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this point of order is to give notice to the committee that uh, at the end of the proceedings, uh, conservatives will be putting forward a motion to recall the Kielberger uh, brothers, unless they provide the total amount that they and their affiliated organizations have paid the Trudeau family before the end of these hearings. They have not yet done so. So there will be a motion to that effect. That is notice to the Kielberger brothers and their lawyer that they should get their calculator sharpened so that they can get that answer before the end of the, these proceedings, or they will be back again to testify. Thank you. So we'll we'll allow for a uh, short answer to Mr. Angus's question. Thank you. And yes. then we'll turn to Mr. Barrett. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'd love me to say I, I appreciate the point of order. We will get you the information. And actually, I appreciate you've stayed on the, ironically, I'm, I'm with you, Mr. Polly. I fairly I say this, but you've stayed on the mission of looking at CCSG. And so I understand that I appreciate your focus on protecting Canadian taxpayers. And I understand. I bet you don't want to answer about what you're doing with your Kenyan donors. I understand Ms. that too. Uh, Thank you. Let's focus. Let's answer Mr. Angus's question, if that's possible, and then we'll turn to Mr. Barrett. Mr. Kielberger will turn to you for a short answer with regards to Mr. Angus's uh, question. Mr. Cowan gave to help children in Kenya exactly what he did. That school continues to operate. All those schools, thousands of children have graduated. We are deeply grateful to him. We're looking through records from 15 years ago to find out what happened. You are absolutely right, sir. I didn't, Mr. Cowan's absolutely right. It never should have happened. We are upset, frankly, more than you, Mr. Angus. We're upset on this because it, it should not have happened. We agree with you. Uh, thank you. We'll turn to Mr. Barrett now for his next round of questions. Mr. Barrett. So uh, staying focused on the CSSG, and I want to be very clear that my question is with respect uh, to the Canada uh, Student Service Grant. Have you or has anyone in your organization been contacted by the RCMP with respect to the CSSG? I believe we've now answered this question from, I think, three different people. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, if you if you do, uh, if you could actually answer the question that's asked instead of uh, carrying on with uh, with your lawyer, um, you ca you responded to me previously that you had not been contacted by the RCMP with respect to Mr. Angus's letter. That is not my question. My question is if you or anyone in your organization has been contacted by the RCMP with re with respect to the CSSG, not if you or uh, your brother, sir. I'm asking about you or anyone in your organization or or affiliate with your organization? Uh, so uh, apparently, listen, I, I have no problems actually answering your question. I think we already did, but, but uh, so you we are- You didn't answer it. The integrity investigations, we're supposed to leave this to the RCMP to actually give comment and disclose on such matters. According to the Assistant Deputy Minister, I feel we've answered, but that is the out of respect for the RCMP. Sorry, even though, sir, is the right. gentleman is the gentleman sitting next to you a serving assistant deputy minister in a government here? He, he served under uh, Prime Minister Harper, and he served under Prime Minister um, Martin. Associate deputy. Associate deputy minister. Sorry, he's correcting here. I, I, so, please feel free to contact the RCMP and if, if you'd like, but I feel you, like we've given you, our. Are, at this time, are you prepared to provide in writing authorization for the RCMP to disclose to this committee whether or not an investigation is ongoing, or if they have initiated any contact with you or anyone with your organization with respect to the Canada Student Service Grant? Will you undertake to provide that uh, authorization in writing? I, I'm actually somewhat befuddled by this entire exchange. Um, the letter went in, I think, last week. They haven't contacted us. 
That being said, uh, I, I'm not asking about Mr. Angus's letter. So what I'm asking yes. for you is to undertake to provide to this committee in writing authorization to be forwarded to the RCMP that that you authorize them to disclose if they have contacted you or anyone at your organization with respect to the Canada Student Service Grant. Yes or no? Well, for the person, what I'm, we'll consult the RCMP on that very question, and we're, we're happy to circle back as soon as the RCMP gives us direction on this. This is an apolitical body, the RCMP. We're, we're, we're just stuck in the middle between did, you and them. Uh, did you have any communications or conversations um, with anyone uh, in government or in the Prime Minister's office prior to your appearance at, uh, at the Parliamentary Committee uh, in the summer? No. Now, at that committee meeting, um, you uh, you told them that none of your conversations with uh, Minister Chagger were with respect to grants. Is that correct? Oh, no, no, no. That's that's absolutely not correct. No, no, no. We spoke to nothing regarding the Canada Student Service Grants, but we spoke to Minister Chagger about the proposal that we had been talking about on uh, youth uh, unemployment. I absolutely brought that up with her in entrepreneurship. And on youth entrepreneurship. Yes, yeah, so youth social entrepreneurship is what it was titled. Why was your uh, lobbying uh, notice modified with respect to um, the disclosure, uh, with respect to which staff were present at that meeting? Because we did our best the first time we submitted it, and I think that we then learned that a mistake was made, and so we clarified the line item. How many communications did the WE organization have with the government in April of 2020? I don't have another off the top of my head, but we submit it to the FINA committee and we'll submit it to you again if you like. Would it be accurate to say that the collective communications with the, the government were the equivalent to a significant part of the duties for one employee? So would actually it'd be hard. That's right. Uh, the, 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 the challenge that you are counting here is that you're counting two volunteers. And listen, I understand that Mr. Angus keeps saying it is not literally not possible for us as volunteers to register. And so I understand the concern. If, if any member of wants to change the legislation, we put proactively everything out on the internet so people can see our engagement on this. So in, in public, in the ethics commissioner, the, the lobbying commissioner, any member of parliament can see our engagement on this as, as volunteers, even though we were not captured uh, under the official reporting requirements. Uh, last uh, year, you um, laid off your government relations director and then immediately brought her back into your employ. Uh, what was the reason for that? You're referring to the director of, uh, of government relations and stakeholder engagements, just to clarify, because her was a small part of her time on government. The rest was foundations and corporate grants. Um, and the reason that we did was we shifted her into a contracting role. So, Ms. Marquez, um, we'll, we'll turn to Mr. Pardon me, Mr. Barry, your time is up. We'll turn to Mr. Fergus now for his round of questions. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Could you just confirm how much time I have to speak? Combien de temps est-ce que j'ai devant moi, Monsieur le What's my speaking time, Mr. Chairman? Five minutes. Yes. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Craig and Mark Kielberger. I appreciate your attendance here today. In your testimony, you alluded to people that attended to WE events. Opposition members asked questions such as how many high-ranking Liberals attended those events? Here's what I'd like to know. Could you remind us of the names of the high-level level, level Liberals that attended those events, please? Uh, uh, sure. The Prime Minister obviously comes to mind. The Premiers of Provinces, when we hold held We Day, I imagine, like, uh, Premier Wynn, did she ever attend? Yeah, Premier Wynn had attended yeah. in the past. Um, um, happy, happy to look into it. Yes. We, just, we, just, uh, we don't have the top of our was, heads. We've had, had, we've had, or it, it, we, we had the land We've had yeah. members of Parliament um, and, and high-ranking yes. officials from all parts. Yeah, we'll, we'll happily give you a list. That's not. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of the names and share a few of the names. Uh, well, just by means of clarification, 
Was there anyone else in addition to liberals that attended those particular events? <laughs> of course, uh, it, it represented Canada. So whoever was in power in Alberta or in power in Saskatchewan or in power in BC, uh, the premiers would come, the mayors would come, the, 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 the prime minister would come, the governor general would come. Yes. Merci pour ça. Thank you for that clarification. In the past, we received funding from other levels of government in Canada and apparently you had contacts with mayors and provincial premiers, the governor general and so on and so forth. Could you please specify which other orders of government across Canada funded you and your organization and at what point did you receive that funding? So you all remember we've received funding over the course of the organization's history, especially the last 10 years. And to answer your question specifically, it was at the provincial level and at times the municipal level, but more so at the provincial level where we were working with um, departments of education and ministries of education, I should say, to help bring the We Schools and We Day program directly to the provinces. Again, it was in 7,000 schools. But again, all political parties, the NDP to the Conservatives uh, to the Liberals have uh, been in the past supportive. Merci pour ça. Thank you. A further question. Over the course of the summer, or rather in the fall, we received information from Mr. Perlmerther regarding the slew of events that Prime Minister Trudeau and his wife attended in terms of we events in addition to the accommodation and lodging costs, taxis, etc. Was that money refunded, reimbursed to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Trudeau, or was the money paid directly to the suppliers in the first instance? Directly to the suppliers. Alors, on ne peut pas... So, we can't really claim that the Trudeaus received that money then, can we? Correct. Alors, uh, uh, well, contrary to the question asked by my honourable colleague, one can't venture to say in all truth or in all frankness that Mr Trudeau received even half the money that the member claimed that you received, in f that Mr Trudeau had received, in fact. Is that correct? To, to be very clear, we never paid any expenses for Mr. Trudeau and we never provided any honorarium to Mr. Trudeau. Oui, alors pour le reste. I see. And what about uh, his wife and members of the family? Expenses were paid directly to the providers and never to those individuals. Well, uh, I see. Mr. Chairman, I think that. Uh, I've run out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fergus. We'll turn to Mr. Polyev for the next five minutes. Mr. Polyev. Yeah, so we'll take it that Mr. Fergus think there's a, uh, thinks there's nothing wrong with uh, an organization paying a politician's mortgage and saying that they're not giving that politician any money uh, by virtue of that logic. Um, uh, Mr. Kielberger, you could not tell me the total value of all of the in-kind and monetary payments of expenses and fees you'd given the Trudeau family. I've tried to add it all up. It's a lot of money. What I have here is $566,345. Is that the total amount of cash and in-kind fees and expenses your organization paid for Mr. Trudeau, his wife, his mother, and his brother? Yes or no? By the end of our time together, we'll have that answer for you. They're adding it. I, we thought we had until the end of the session. We'll, we'll, I promise. Well, we'll you've you had almost your year. It just—it looks like incredibly suspicious. You still haven't been able to do the arithmetic, and it does oh. show the sordid relationship your family, your organization has with the Trudeau family that you can't even add up all the benefits and cash that you've paid them. So we'll move on to my next question. Um, what was the role exactly of Mr. Chen, senior advisor? 
to the uh, Prime Minister in setting up this program? I don't believe that, I don't think he had any role in that. Mr. Uh, is that the answer for both of you? Yes, that's correct. I, I, who are you referring to, sir? Can you remember ben this, Chin. please? Ben Chin. There's no role. Craig, no role? Not that I'm aware of. Then why did you send him a, a message on LinkedIn on June 27th saying, Hello, Ben. Thank yeah. you for your kindness in helping shape our latest program with the government. Warmly, Craig. Sure. So I, I sent 100 messages because I only had seven people, eight people on LinkedIn before that. And so that day, 100 messages went out. My EA sent them to people to join on LinkedIn, and he was one of them. Yes. I actually didn't, but Sorry, EA did. Craig, this is your message. It's signed by you. And if I could be clear, it doesn't yes. just say, I wish you well. It says, yeah. Ben, if, excuse me, thank you for your kindness in helping shape our latest program with the government. Warmly, Craig. You sent that, did you I, not? I don't, yeah, I don't dispute that that, that was sent. Um, but but, sorry, sorry, um, you, you got yourself in a lot of trouble here. You've just said a moment ago, you thought that the Prime Minister's senior advisor, Mr. Chen, had no role in this, the establishment of the program, but I have correspondence where you thanked him for helping shape that very program. So why did you thank him for shaping the program when now you claim you didn't know he played any role in the program. My EA wanted to personalize and very kindly as a great EA, wrote a few lines to 100 different LinkedIn requests that went that same day to different people to join my LinkedIn page. No, but this was not, this was not a mess. Excuse me, Craig, Craig, you're in a lot of trouble here, my friend. You're under oath. Perjury is a crime. You, I'm, I'm you excuse me, excuse me. You said a moment ago that you thought the prime minister's chief advisor had no role in establishing this program. Your message to him did not say, thank you for joining me on LinkedIn. It said, thank you for your kindness in helping shape our latest program with the government. Warmly, Craig. So, so which is it? I want to ask you clear clearly. Did you know that Mr. Chin was playing a role in establishing this program? Yes or no? No. So you said you sent a message to someone thanking him for helping shape our latest program, even though you had no knowledge of his involvement in the program? A hundred messages went out to my LinkedIn uh, people and my EA kindly drafted them. Right, okay. So you sent a hundred messages out to random people thanking them for establishing a government program? No, each, each had a personalized uh, LinkedIn request. That was his LinkedIn request. His, his LinkedIn request asked you to thank him for establishing this program? No, nope, that was my LinkedIn request. Yeah. <laughs> okay, your story is shifting here, my friend. And so this is important because you've until now claimed the prime minister's office wasn't involved in shaping the program, it was just a bureaucrat at ESDC. You've tried to distance the prime minister whose your organization has paid off. And now we find out that you corresponded with his top advisor, thanking him for shaping the program. So allow me to phrase it this way. That was the only correspondence I had in the course of two years with him was a three-line LinkedIn request to join. But this isn't a LinkedIn request, my friend. This is you thanking him for establishing a program. This was not, you did not say thank you for joining me on LinkedIn. You said thank you for, for your kindness in helping shape our latest program with the government. You have said that, and I appreciate your lawyer's trying to help you out here. He's, he looks extremely uncomfortable, and I don't blame him. Uh, I hope he's being paid well for this, and I think he'll be in your employ for a very long time uh, because lying to a parliamentary committee is, in fact, an offense. But you have not explained why a moment ago you told chair. us that, that, that Mr. Chair. Chin did not have any involvement in the program and that Thank you actually chair. sent a message to him chair. thanking him for that involvement. Mr. Paul, you have, I'm going to recognize Mr. Dong's point of order. Thank you, Chair. My point of order is that uh, I, I think the, the question was put, the answer was given, and then the question was, uh, a comment actually was put uh, towards uh, uh, the lawyer who has no uh, place to speak or respond, and I, I just think that it's, Thank it's you, Mr. Dong. Is there a point, a point of order? order? Okay, thank you. I, I don't think that's a point of order. I think it's a point of debate. Uh, okay. Mr. Polyev, we'll get you to finish that question. We'll give the Kielbergers an opportunity to answer, and then we'll move on to the next questioner. So, Mr. Chin actually responded to your message, 
He said, great to hear from you, Craig. Let's get our young working. So obviously in direct reference to the program, not, you know, not thank you for adding me or agreeing to add me on, on LinkedIn, as you're now claiming. Are you testifying that you never spoke or communicated in any way, shape, or form with Mr. Chen outside of this message before or after? In two years, correct. No, ever? Well, I have a hard time getting LinkedIn followers after this. <laughs> Mr. Pauly, we'd love you to follow us on LinkedIn. Yes. That'd be awesome. Uh, thank you. We'll... Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Um, Matthew Turrigan, in October 2020's report, found different, uh, different things, and he reported that the government of Canada, not We Charity, first proposed the We Charity, that it might be suitable to administer the um, CSSG. The government of Canada considered other organizations and entities that might be capable of administrating the Canada Stud Student Services Grant, and that the government did not predetermine, and in particular, the PMO's office did not predetermine that the WE charity would be selected to administer the Canada uh, Student Services Grant. So Mr. Torrigan's report states that in addition to documents provided to the parliamentary committee, parliamentary testimony, that we provided clarifications and additional information when requested. There is. There's a few things I'd like to highlight. One, who Matthew Torrigan is. He's a former police chief of Waterloo. He's a member of uh, the Monk Center Advisory Board as a fellow. He's somebody who serves as Assistant Deputy Minister, Solicitor General, uh, Solicitor General specifically for the province of Ontario. Um, he's extremely well respected and apolitical. He reviewed all 5,000 pages of documents. We've had many conversations with him in his independent report, um, and he found that that's all the information that you shared is is just that it is correct now again another another open-ended question giving you the opportunity to sort of you know provided provide us with the the, the most uh up-to-date information or documents i understand that a breakdown of expenses which i understand that you are working on and that you will diligently provide to us today and feel no threat who do not feel bullied we are just here to be able to collect as much information as we possibly can so you've provided you know in previous uh, testimonies documents annotation agreements information you're going to be providing uh, you know a copy of the contract uh, with regards to the national pr making sure that the services would have been also in french in quebec is there any other additional information that isn't public, that you haven't made public with regards to the CSSG program that isn't in the public sphere that you would like to share with us? Uh, uh, no, however, if I, if I may, uh, to, to take your time uh, to Mr. Polyev's request. So um, the total in speaking fees went out to $217,500. The total in expenses uh, worked into $210,250.92. Therefore, adding together what the uh, members, um, uh, Margaret Trudeau, uh, Sophie Trudeau, and Sasha Trudeau received over that decade-ish, plus the expenses, uh, works out to $427,750.92. And, and so, it is, so I'm sorry, so it is not the $566,345. Uh, because there's a 20% uh, that goes to Speaker Spotlight as part of the, the, the booking, even on the text. And just okay. because of Mr. Polyev's comments, we want to be explicitly clear that we would like to just reserve the fact that we would need to double check to ensure that every single was paid directly by us as suppliers to others, because yeah. we don't want to be speaking in that okay. anyway, because yeah. we're here, of course, being put on the spot. Yeah. Um, but that is a total number, and it's the correct information. And, and if yeah. I may add to your, so I apologize if I may add, you, know, you mentioned the report by the former Deputy Solicitor General who identified that there was not uh, any appropriate dealings with We Charity and engaging the government. Also, there was an independent review by forensic auditors who looked at the financial soundness of the charity at the time and who corrected the record as the charity was in a fine, financially sound position, contrary to the narrative of a bailout that some people have phrased this as. I just want to put that also in the public record. I thank you for that. So, again, is there any other public document that has not been shared in the public sphere or domain that you would like to share with us? 
before you leave? This has been nine months. Uh, we've testified now, it's going to be seven hours. We've had other five team, uh, in total, five senior reps. We've given thousands, literally thousands of pages now on this matter over to various government groups. We've offered to cooperate. We know there's nine investigations going on. I, I don't know. I think this has to be the most well-studied matter in that I've ever seen, period. Okay. Um, going back to the question uh, that I asked you before with regards to engaging and, and concluding a, a contract with a national PR firm to ensure that services would be done in both official languages and specifically French in Quebec, if your prior experiences um, involved and in including providing these services, which I, to my understanding, also to English schools and more specifically the EMSB schools in Montreal, uh, why did you feel it necessary to go out and engage uh, the national PR, for, uh, PR firm, uh, if you had prior experience to doing this? We were given a matter of weeks to uh, deliver this program in both official languages, coast to coast to coast. Uh, it was all hands on deck. Uh, we needed to help um, to ensure that as many students in Quebec as possible to engage, but also as many nonprofits in Quebec uh, could engage. A part of national PR's activities were to help identify um, nonprofit organizations in the province that we could potentially partner with, and uh, dozens of organizations, if I'm not mistaken, in the province of Quebec put up their hands, and we're grateful for that. Okay. Um, and also, you said that you were working, you know, putting up this program was not just the eve if i can if i can say it as as such but this was a program that was being worked uh, in, in the previous years correct correct we've had the opportunity to work with young people all across the country in 7000 schools at least again until uh, the, the political fallout of, of the situation and uh, 400 of those schools were in the province of quebec that's correct okay thank so, you Thank you. Your time is up, up Ms. Latanzio. We're going to turn to Mr. Fortin. Monsieur Fortin. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kielberger, your relationship uh, with the Trudeau family, and I include in that the PM's mother, brother, wife, uh, the whole entourage, i.e. family members. Now, it's my understanding that that relationship continued until, at the very least, uh, last summer when the scandal broke. But since then, have you had any contact with the uh, uh, Trudeau family members? And have there been any conferences uh, that they've attended in any way on the behalf of We Charity? No. OK. Uh I see. Another question. I listened to the exchange that you had with my colleague, Mr. Polyev, earlier regarding the famous, infamous uh, LinkedIn invite. Uh, and it's based on what I understood, uh, there was no need to thank the individual, given that that individual never, in fact, helped to, to uh, get the program up and running. But here's my question. How many people uh, over time have you thanked people for, have you thanked for doing nothing in that respect? We, as a charity, always seek to personalize correspondence. Even uh, LinkedIn requests, we get a line or two of personalization. But we, as a charity, try to make people engage with us because that's what yeah. it's going to like But that's not really the crux of my question. From your testimony, and I don't recall the name of the individual that Mr. Paliev spoke of, but uh, you thanked him for helping him, for the fact that he helped you get the program up and running. But my question is, how many people have you thanked people who haven't actually helped you get the program up and running? How many of them have you thanked? Did you sense any such thanks to others? Uh, to clarify, a, a staff member wrote that um, every person got a personalized two-liner, and because the federal government generally was engaging with us, it was a thank you for supporting. I don't even know the wording uh, for youth okay. thing, whatever that, whatever. Mr. Don't Paul, you have you so you sent several such uh, texts uh, to thank people for having helped you when, in fact, they didn't actually help you. Is that correct? All the messages went out um, that day and the day before. All thanks for supporting kids. Thanks for helping youth volunteers. No, mate. For supporting kids, though. Not supporting kids. That's not what I'm saying. You said thanks for helping us get the, the program up and running. So here's my question. How many people did you thank in that manner? Vous avez... so, I understand what you're 
are not hiding the fact that we engaged with the PMO. We had a conversation with Rick Thesis, Thais, I think is his name. Thais. 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 We had a conversation with the PMO's office on this. There's no need for us to hide this. It's on the record. We legitimately spoke to them. They had actual questions. We gave the answers to the questions. He wanted options. Okay. We gave him options. I, I, there's okay. No why we'd... okay. Well, I didn't receive any text thanking me, so if you'd like to thank me for something, please do go ahead at some point. Thank you, Mr. Kielberger. Thank you, Mr. Fultown. Gentlemen, we've, we've gone over time there. We'll go to Mr. Angus now for the next round of questions. Mr. Angus. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, you have testified a number of times or a number of hours here, but I, I can never seem to get some straight answers here. Uh, so if, if you don't mind, I'm going to have to keep going back at it. Uh, the only person I think that's been gaslighted more than me is poor Rachel Wernick, who again today, you say it was Rachel Wernick who reached out to you that you've had this long standing relationship with Rachel Wernick. But the documents don't show that. They show an April 17th meeting with you, Craig, Sophia Marquez, and Minister Chagger. Uh, your documents then thank her and say that she was the one who suggested uh, establishing the volunteer stream. So that's the service stream. So let's just clarify the record here. You met with Minister Chagger. She suggested the charity street, the service stream, correct? So Minister Shager spoke on a different proposal, suggested we incorporate yeah. services to it. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then she said to make a, a new stream uh, to, to add this in, which you then uh, contacted. Um, um, let's see, where did you contact you? You contacted uh, them on the 22nd and thanked them and said that you had been advised by Minister Chagger to add this in. So it wasn't Rachel Wernick who came up with this. Minister Chagger talked to you and you guys began working on this, correct? So I, I've submitted the email that says from Rachel Wernick on the 19th, sorry to write out of the blue, I need to urgently speak to you about a matter. And I wrote back to her saying, happy to speak. We spoke that same day. The email we've also submitted says, Rachel, happy to help. We'll get you some materials right away on this service initiative the whole it's okay, all documented okay. in paper papers doesn't i know apply. it is i know it is because uh, unlike my liberal colleagues i actually read all the papers so april 17th you meet april 18th before uh warnick reaches out of the blue she's talk uh esdc is talking to kovacevic and kovacevic says hey stop looking into spotify we have another possibility and that's you guys. Was Spotify, so, was Spotify really being considered to deliver a new service? Well, that's what they keep telling us. So anyways, I'm looking here, you know, happy Monday. <laughs> Minister Chagger expressed interest in exploring ways to adapt the entrepreneurship proposal we submitted to Minister Ning and include a service component. She suggests that we should consider opening a service stream. So that was Sophia Marquez. So then you wrote and said, you know, thank you. Minister Chagger gave us this. Uh, advice, and this is what we're following up on. So you were following up, and you already had the the plan started by the time Rachel Warnick. So let's just like cut to the chase. You met with Chagger. She gave you this idea. So when Warnick, she didn't come out of the blue. You were meeting with her boss beforehand, correct? Well, I agree with you. She didn't come out of the blue because she had funded us two years earlier to test this. No, 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 no. Don't come on, come on, Craig, come on, Craig. No, you hit. met on the. 17th, two days before, you Sister, met the minister. Can't you at least admit you met the minister? Mr. Admit it. Can I answer the question, please? So, again, June 29th, they got awarded $800,000 to test service programs of 2018. No, 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 no. Mr. Mr. Angus, this, uh, your time is up, Mr. Sorry. Angus. We're going to allow for the answering the question, and uh, then we're going to go to Mr. I'm asking about the question on April 17th, and he was... He's going back two years before. It was that meeting. So just Mr. Kielberger, can you answer the yeah. question so Come that on. we can move on Come to on. the next question? Yeah, please. Sure. Mr. Kielberger. We had worked with ESDC for years, including at the request of white papers. They had funded us previously on service. Ms. Warnick had been deeply involved with us. At her request, she asked our help. We delivered the help to help kids. You didn't mention that. You said Chagger mm -hmm. asked you to help. On the seat, Mr. Angus, meeting. we might get a chance to come back you. to you, Mr. Gord, Gord. Monsieur Gord, we'll turn to you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, when did the first meeting with Justin Trudeau go back in time to, please? 
This was well before he was an elected member of parliament. He was involved in youth oh, service. Timovic. That's it's why. Timovic. Yeah, he was involved in youth service programming, as, of course, as we were. And this is well over a, a decade ago. Um, our areas of, of intersection uh, around youth leadership and youth programming had intersect. And, of course, he was involved with the Katimovic, which is a, a wonderful organization. He was chair of the Katimovic. In fact, that's the conversation. Donc, on parle... So you're talking about 20 years or even more. Uh, so I think about 10 years or 10, so, 15, yeah, 10, 15, it's, it's so, somewhere in that, in that range. Again, this is before he was in life. C'est parfait. Perfect. Well, over the years, did you develop a friendship? And now, in my definition of a friendship is having his uh, cell phone number, for example, and he might have yours. And from time to time, you'd speak on the phone once a month, once every couple of months on any topic, not necessarily on a specific one. Uh, the answer is no. And we just to also share for Mr. Polyev, we weren't also friends on LinkedIn with him either. Yeah, we, we never had a cell phone, nor I don't know if you ever had ours, but no. we certainly never had his cell phone. And we've never had a meal together socially, never golfed. Okay. okay, so you knew the Prime Minister quite well. When was the first event that he took part in? If I'm not mistaken, it was one of the wee days about a decade ago, maybe a little little longer than that. We, we have shared this information with uh, the FINA group. We're happy to, to find information again, but it was well over a decade ago. I think it was when he was chair of Katimovic, I think it was like 2007, he was chair wrapping up. We invited Katimovic as a, him in that capacity. I think he didn't come, but maybe the next year he did. Again, this is before the, the politics uh, in the Katimovic role. Okay. I see. Are you cognizant of the fact that the program in, that was subject to a call for proposals, uh, in fact, uh, was exempt from any actually actual bidding process, uh, that there was actually no tender process whatsoever at the end of the day? Are you aware of that? I'm glad you asked that question because we were under the assumption that it, there were other groups, um, not Spotify, it was actually Shopify, but other groups that were being considered. That's what we were told. So we assumed, perhaps incorrectly, but we assumed that at least at the initial stages that this was all fo following regular processes. So, in fact, to be candid, I wish that this had gone to proposal. A, a tender. I wish that anyone could have bid on this. Uh, again, I, I, to be candid, I wish this had been an open uh, bid because I, I still feel we may have been a good contender among many others. I wish there had been a proper recusal in the process. I wish people had done additional diligence that people here are speaking of if there had been any concerns. But also, it was a pandemic. It was a different time. People were doing their best. And, and that's, you know, again, but to Mark's point, <laughs> We, we, we were actually told that multiple other organizations were being considered explicitly. Yeah. Well, we were also told at this committee that uh, in light of the architecture of the program, you were the only ones in Canada that had access to over 7,000 schools and that you had the requisite infrastructure to reach out to a maximum optimal number of students in a short time frame. So it was a tailored contract for your organization because you were the only ones cut out to handle it. They didn't even bother looking elsewhere. So you were front of the line. And at the end of the day, you were victims, victims of this unfortunate circumstance. Now, as far as the rollout of the program was concerned, uh, how were students selected? Did they register? Did they enroll? Did you hold competitions in the various schools? Yes, to the honourable member, uh, we had students uh, participate um, with the program. Uh, unfortunately, the program didn't actually take place, but applying online. There was an ESCC process that uh, they defined. There was ESC criteria that was defined by them. And so we had well over 35,000 students uh, sign up in a matter of, of, of days. Uh, it, was, it was quite remarkable to see. Uh, there was a tremendous... Sorry to cut you off, but could you please 
provide the application form uh, to the committee, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gourd, that's your last question. Uh, we'll give you an, uh, an opportunity to answer that. Mr. Gielberger, Mr. Gielberger, please answer. Happy to do that. And Mr. Chair, at some point, can we also ask for an additional health break? But uh, to answer the member's question, we're happy to do that. Yes, we can uh, We can break for uh, a five minute break now. Uh, members uh, will break for, we'll suspend for five minutes. Mr. Sabera. Uh, thank you, Chair, and again, welcome everyone. Uh, to Mark and Craig, how many hours have you testified in front of two committees in the last uh, few months? This will be hour seven. So seven hours of testimony that you've delivered uh, to many members and, and answering many questions. I do, I do have one question. I know that a few of my opposition colleagues have been quick uh, to cut you off on this question. So I do want to give you a moment to answer. Um, but was April of 2020 the first time you talked to the government about running a student program? Correct. Okay. And then just to correct the, the record uh, from my parliamentary colleague, Mr. Angus, it's not Spotify. It was uh, Shopify, the, the name that was mentioned uh, way back when in sorry, the finance sorry, testimony. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Angus. Yes, Mr. Sorbera has... It's deeply embarrassed me. I'm showing my age of getting Spotify and Shopify mixed up. So I want I want it stricken from the Hansard record. So I, uh, it'll never I'll never show myself that. Old I, I'm not so sure that that's a point you, of Sir. order, but that's not a point uh, of order. I'm sure okay. you're debating with Continue, yourself. Continue, Mr. Sorbera. Yeah. You're you're welcome. I just would <laughs> thank you, like colleagues. Uh, Mr. Sorbera will turn back. I, to you. I would like I would like that time uh, given back to to me, so we can ask the, the next question. And, and again, uh, going back to my my opening uh, remarks with Mark and Craig. Uh, to uh, having uh, an MP write an agency, the RCMP, I personally feel it is it's completely wrong for them to say that an investigation should be started uh, towards uh, any individual organization here in Canada. That to me is, is just politically not, not what we need to be doing and wrong. Uh, and, and I know you folks have commented on that, that it's not appropriate for politicians or public servants uh, to be doing that. I want to get that on the record because uh, the independence of those agencies uh, is beyond repute and, and we need to keep it in, the, in that light and we shouldn't uh, mix uh, those two things. I do wish to comment, uh, the, the Prime Minister's uh, mo mother, Margaret Trudeau, I take it she came to speak on mental health to young people, is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. As I stated in the finance uh, committee hearings, uh, she also came to speak here in the city of Vaughan, uh, and actually my riding, in front of a thousand uh, uh, individuals. It was a Women's Day event, and uh, her, 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 her speech and her remarks, uh, obviously, for me, captivated the room, and, and many people uh, listened very attentively and, and found her story on mental health to be very inspiring. So I think that um, with regards to charities in Canada, you mentioned the re remarks on, on, on where charities are today um, and how, how do you feel uh, about that situation? And I do want to make a comment, cause I, another comment, and I apologize for doing this. Uh, I do want to apologize in a certain sense of what your families have born, uh, have born through this whole process. Uh, you have young children, you have grandparents, many of us have young children and grandparents and grandparents as well. And it's quite unfair for anybody witness coming in front of a committee uh, to then feel threatened uh, by uh, individuals because of, of testimony and questions from, from opposition members or be it uh, as is. So on that level there, uh, you have my empathy and, and uh, appreciation for coming back by empathy as well. Any closing remarks, gentlemen? We, we appreciate that. And, and uh, as much as we appreciate it for, for us, you know, we really look to the issue of young people in Canada, who of course are really ones that lost out in this. And if I could just appeal again with humility and grace to all of you as elected members of parliament, you have a tremendous amount of power to help young people this upcoming summer. And once again, through coming together as a group of members of parliament from all parties to, as part of your report, create some opportunities uh, for those young people. We also want to thank um, the members of parliament thus far for being respectful of this process. Thank you, even all members of parliament, including Mr. Angus. Um, thank you for staying focused uh, largely on pandemic spending, the mandate of this committee. We really appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Walkerton, can I get that, that time made up for Mr. Angus took away? You, you, we'll always make up that time. So okay, you, thank you. If, if you've got uh, just a short question, we very, can probably very fit quickly. it in. 
Uh, gentlemen, any any quick points on the conversations you had in the prior years in 17, 18, 19 with regards to your interactions with the government and how programs were, were put in place or um, and, and so forth? Thank you. Because I, again, I, I know I said this very quickly, but I don't think most people understand how this program came to be. Uh, Rachel Warnock first came to visit our office in October 2017 to see about our capacity. On June 29th, 2018, we were awarded uh, $800,000 for the Youth Service Initiative to test programs to engage youth nationally in service. Of course, this has been a long-standing launching a national service program. May 19th, at ESDC asked us to put together a white paper on how the civil service could implement a national service program. On August 21st, uh, they came to us in 2019 again to deepen that conversation. March 6th, they asked us to prepare, uh, again, a follow-up white paper for their civil service. These were requests that came to us from the civil service uh, because of our capacity on this. This wasn't a out of the blue. This wasn't a sudden pandemic issue. We had been the go-to uh, for uh, the government and helping to support, as were many other charities. So we had a deep relationship with the Rachel Warnick and ESDC. And as I feel badly that she got dragged into this also. Thanks. This whole program should have just happened for kids. Thanks so much. We'll turn to Mr. Fortin now for, for the next two and a half minutes. Mr. Fortin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps a quick question, if I may. Uh, recognizing Mr. Kerry, point of order. Mr. Chair, just looking at my notes, I think we're starting around five, and that means the Conservatives would go first. Am I correct, or are we? No, you're not correct. That? But thank you okay. for uh, we can touch base, Mr. F Monsieur Fortin. Mr. Fortin, the floor is yours. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I didn't miss out on that time then, just now. And of course, there's the translation interpretation lag, but I'll leave that up to your uh, judgment, Mr. Kilberger. I was wondering. In light of, well, no, forget what I was about to say. 2017, 2018, Monsieur Sir Kilberger, we, charity, in fact, uh, failed uh, to meet a number of financial engagements or responsibilities. Some folks said that it wasn't serious and that it didn't uh, have any bearing on your ability to meet your program needs. And others called into question the solvency of we charity. So here's my question. Did anyone in the federal government, before awarding you the a Canada Student Service Grant contract, uh, did anyone hone in on the fact that you had not lived up to your financial obligations? Mr. Fortin, I believe you're speaking about the issue of uh, bank covenants, uh, widely misunderstood in this conversation. It was one line out of 27 pages of audits. It was a technical breach. RBC, our banker, had no concerns about it. And specifically, we changed our fiscal year and the subsequent year had contracts that were uh, part of the past fiscal year. So as a result, we did have a technical breach on our bank covenants. I had no way well, uh, it's not. My question isn't whether it was founded, well founded or not. But my question is: Was there anyone from the government who says, "I have misgivings. I'm concerned. What about that?" Uh, so our our financial audits uh, were online, and uh, there was no questions that were asked specifically on the issue of bank. Okay. Merci. Okay. So okay, that's what I want to know. No further questions on that particular matter. Now, you said. That, that you uh, no longer have had any dealings with the Trudeau family since uh, the conference events of last summer. Could you please tell me, uh, Mrs. Kilberger, one of the two of you, why Mrs. Trudeau is no longer taking part in conferences on the behalf of WE Charity? Are you speaking on behalf of Margaret Trudeau? Is that correct, sir? For example, for, for, for example. Well, for example, yes, Margaret uh, Trudeau, why don't you invite her to take part in conferences anymore? Well, because of the pandemic, we haven't had any conferences, of course, since, but also, of course, because of the politics. But the pandemic is the, is the principal reason. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monsieur Fortin. We're going to turn to Mr. Angus now for the next two and a half minutes. Mais, mais minutes on... My two minutes are already uh, over, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, we certainly... Vous avez you, enlevé you, the... Because I gave you so much time in the last one, Mr. Angus. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I don't want to be a bug. I'm sure you're you're already pr probably putting more misinformation that I'm claiming on Twitter, but I may not be able to read a budget, you think, but I can certainly read your emails uh, when you supply them. And this idea of dragging Rachel Wernick continually, I find really troublesome because she did not reach out to you. You had already established this. And it says, uh, Craig Kielberger. Now, I, I hope we're not going to have another LinkedIn moment, but to Minister Chagger, dear Minister Chagger, thank you for your time Friday. That's April 17th. We appreciate your thoughtful offer to connect us with relevant members of your ministry. That would be Rachel Wernick. And over the weekend, so that's the two days before Rachel Wernick reaches out to you, our team has been hard at work to adapt your suggestion of a second stream focused on a summer ser service opportunity. We have outlined a three-month summer service jobs opportunity to engage 20,000 young people, and you basically list what becomes the Canada Summer Student Grant. Now, I, I bet you don't have to register time as a lobbyist for having spent all that time all weekend before Rachel Wernick contacted you because, as you said, you're just a volunteer. So that's the record. Uh, all this misinformation that you talked to her three years ago is irrelevant. You talked to the minister on April 17th. You don't want to seem to deal with that. And then you um, co contacted her to remind her that you'd talked to her on the 17th, and she was going to put you in touch, uh, what she did on the 19th. So that's, that's the record. But because I only have a few seconds left, I want to go back to Reed Cowan, a member of your board, your advisory board. Uh, for you to tell us that you're really shocked this only ever happened once, even though we know you took down at least two of his plaques, um, he has asked for police investigation. He has asked for the IRS to investigate you. He has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, you read Cowan and all the other uh, donors across this country and across North America that this Velcro plaque scheme that your staff bragged about only happened twice? So you're, you're, we are grateful to every single one of our donors. And when a mistake is made, no one is more upset than us. And I am so upset about this. And I have. I know, but David Stillman, David Stillman, who paid for all your your uh, the Stillman Foundation, who paid for all the uh, audits that exonerated you, he had a conversation with Mr. Cowan. We were told so. You know, someone who is paying your audits represents you to call Mr. Cowan, and he tells him to drop it. He says to just drop it. So that's not exactly saying sorry. It's like you're making the organization look bad. Um, so again, are you telling me that this only happened twice and all and the, all these Velcro plaques that people were lying to Bloomberg, people were lying to the fifth estate, Mr. Cowan just is upset and got it wrong. Is that your position? That's all I need to know. Is that your position? That'll be the last uh, the last question there on this round, Mr. Angus. Thank Mr. You. Kielberger, we'll turn to you. And to our, our tens of thousands of donors over the years, the projects have gone to where they're supposed to. Um, we have done our best and we're grateful to, because the money got to the kids as it is supposed to. And in that, it has changed lives, millions of lives. And we're grateful to each and every one of our donors. We'll turn to and Mr. Cowan's plaque. We'll turn to uh, Mr. Kerry and he'll be splitting his time with Mr. Polyev. Mr. Kerry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, given the statements made in We Economy, um, it's clear that We Charity conducted a survey that collected data on voting in the 2011 federal election. So my question is, uh, how did you receive the contact information of these WE alumni when many of them would have been underage kids at the time of the WE day that they attended? And I'm curious, um, how was the data collected and by whom? And did you ever contract your data analysis with any third parties that also might do um, data analysis for political parties, such as uh, data sciences, for example. So to the honorable member, uh, the short answer is no on the data sciences or any associated group that would do political data analysis. And that was part of an university called Mr. Measurement. And they uh, asked young people if uh, because of the program, they're more likely to do many things, including um, vote. 
And uh, that was here. give to charity. And we never, just, I'll save you the time of asking, we never asked who they voted for and we had no interest in that information. All right. I was wondering, will you provide uh, to the committee a copy of the reports that Mission Measurement LLC provided to a We Charity on the project, that the Free the Children alumni study? Absolutely. And, and in fact, we're very proud of the outcomes. Uh, 80 plus percent of our youth uh, alumni continue to volunteer. 79% uh, vote in the last federal election. I believe 83% continue to give to charity. It's such a shame that that's coming to an end, those programs in Canadian schools. Now, um, did you share that report with any other third parties? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's actually on our website. Uh, so anyone oh. can look at the report. I, I was looking for it. I didn't quite, I didn't see it. Um, well, now, now, what um, what measures do you use uh, to control the use of uh, We Charity data um, and for youth that uh, may have signed up for these We events? Because the We events, they're the... Um, uh, they're looked after of me to we, right? And then the charity is a separate thing altogether. So what? how do you control this data that's collected by either the charity or um, me to we? Yeah, so so the, all the we day events were, of course, part of we charity. It was part of that initiative through the we charity and the we schools initiative, uh, a very robust system. We haven't shared that data with anybody, including political parties, um, and uh, followed proper processes and protocols. So you can guarantee that that data was not shared with any provincial or federal political party. Correct. You can do that. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Kerry. We'll turn to Mr. Polyev. What was the name of the assistant that you claim wrote your email to through LinkedIn to Mr. Ben Chen? Mr. Polyev, um, I've gotten death threats. Our staff have gotten death threats. The speaking bureau has gotten death threats. I am not naming another employee, especially a former executive assistant to you, sir. So we will be asking for it to be handed over to the committee uh, and we can keep that information from the public, but I want to find out if this person actually exists. Do you commit to giving that uh, person's name to the committee? With the permission of that person and the conversations that will unfold, I, I you know, we'll, we'll get back to you on that point. That, that's a private matter. No, it's not a private matter, actually. It, you, this is someone you claim was writing correspondence to the Prime Minister's office on your behalf. Uh, we want to confirm that this person actually exists because the correspondence that has your name on it contradicts the testimony that you've given directly. And you will need to provide it uh, to, uh, to, uh, contradict, to, to prove that you, in fact, actually are telling the truth here because it's very, uh, very hard to believe. Did you send, you said you said a hundred different emails thanking people for their role in setting up the Canada Student Service Grant? Is that what you said? Mr. Polly, does anybody in your office write your correspondence? I'm asking you, I, the question was a hundred people, yes or no? Is that how many people you thank for setting up your, your, your Canada Student Service Grant? Do you, do you write all your correspondence, sir? You don't have an assistant helps you with any of it? I can tell you I didn't send Ben Chin an email asking, thanking him for a program that I didn't think you set up. So back to you. Stop trying to, you try. You know, your, your smirking and your evading might be fun now. It's not going to be fun when we're, we're, we're investigating you for contempt of parliament. Did you actually send a hundred different thank yous to members of the government for their role in helping set up the Canada Student Service Grant? That's the question, and it's a yes or no. No, because we sent 100 messages to different individuals About, oh. across a variety of industries that I was asking to link with me on LinkedIn, and each got a personalized two-line, would you link with me? And it was a personalized two-line message to each individual prepared by my EA. They came from 100 lists. We had hundreds of names. The EA shortlisted it because I asked her to build my LinkedIn profile. Right. Okay, so you just randomly, he, if somehow or another... In the middle of setting up this uh, this program, you decided to add Ben Chin, whom you claim you hadn't spoken to in two years, to a list of people to randomly thank about creating a program you thought he had no role in creating. It was one of 100 names that were contacted okay. that day right. to email LinkedIn. And right. That's yeah. the simple fact. Well, next question. Um, how much did uh, you pay for Sophie Trudeau's attendance at the uh, London weed event uh in march of 2020 how much 
So just to be clear, we've previously given uh, all the... No, you pseudo- haven't actually. No, sir, you haven't. To be clear, again, you're, you're giving false testimony. You have not given the itemized... Sir, you have not given the itemized amounts for that Mr. event. Excuse How me, much? Mr. Chairman. Is, do I see a point of order, Ms. Yeah. Latanzio? Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sorry to interject, but I mean, you know, I think that we're supposed to be working in, in collaboration and trying to get the information, as much information as we Ms. possibly Latangio, can. Ms. Latangio, is there a and, point of order? Yes, there is. Okay, I'll, I'll hear your is, point of order. Okay. I think that, you know, we ask a question and then we answer a question or we assume that we know the answer to the question. I defer to you, Mr. Chairman, and see and, and ask you as to whether thank, or thank not you, Ms. Lund. this is, you know, part of decorum. No, I'm sorry, if this is part of decorum, and I need for you to rule on this part of, you know, the way we're carrying ourselves in this committee today. Thank you. I need I, for you I, to rule I, on that. I, I, I ruled the question. In, in support of, uh, I believe that we are undertaking according to the rules. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul, uh, we'll turn chair, to you to finish chair, off the questions. I have a point of order. Chair. Point of order, Mr. Dong. Yeah, could you clarify, is this wrong, the five-minute round or two-and-a-half-minute round? Because your, your, your answer to uh, uh, Ms. Shufo this is, is, this is a This is a five-minute round, and we will get to, uh, okay. you are splitting your time next. All right. Uh, thank you. Mr. Polyev, we'll let you finish that question and get a, an answer from from the Kielbergers, and then we'll move on to the next question. Just the total amount that the uh, WE organizations and its affiliates paid in transportation, fees, accommodations, and any other expenses related to Ms. Sophie Gregoire's attendance at the WE event in March of 2020 in London. Just the amount, please, for that event. So I don't have it, but we'll get it for you. And I just wanted to clarify that what we previously gave the fee was the total amounts. Just the total, so just, not the itemized. You have not given the itemized amounts, and I, I know that you don't want to it to be public how much you paid for her accommodations and for that sumptuous travel right before you sought government funding from her husband. Um, next question, is there another family that you paid over uh, $400,000 in fees and expenses other than the Trudeaus? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Pierre, Mr. Polyev, we are out of time now. We'll turn to Mr. Kielberg. Can we just get an answer to, from that? Uh, to answer that question, absolutely. Over 25 years, we've engaged dozens of speakers, and so that dollar amount would not be out of the norm for our most frequent speakers. Can you name one family? Come. Oh, I'm not going to name those names, but there are, are speakers who have come to multiple events, who have done multiple fundraisers in excess of 40 events, as they did in fundraisers and awareness raisers for us. We've absolutely paid because we don't do telemarketers. We don't do street canvassers. This is how we raise funds. Over $400,000 to one family. Thank you, Mr. Polyev. We'll turn to Mr. Erskine-Smith splitting his time with Mr. Dong. Thanks very much. And I appreciate your time here. I'm just wondering, because I know you said you wanted to get to the and read Cowan's concerns, and I appreciate that. How were you able to confirm that the plaques had, in fact, been removed? Who, who on the ground confirmed that to you? Sorry, would you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so you, you've confirmed that Reed Cowan's the plaque was removed. You said there were, you confirmed that it happened in one other instance. Yeah. How did you confirm that? Who, who on the ground, I don't need a name, just the, who, what position of that individual confirmed that to you? Uh, one of the local... <laughs> My bike and drove out to the school and took a look to make sure that that, you know, and found the plaque wasn't there. And that was a serious issue. Yes. And you were aware that the plaque for Reed Cowan was associated with that particular school? Uh, correct. I, 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 we apologize for this. And, and, and in full transparency, that same village, we have found out around that same time, there was a second plaque that we know of. And that's why we're doing a full investigation of that, of, of, of cross organization, but particularly that time frame to try to understand what went wrong? We phased out plaques about 12 years ago because the local community doesn't want plaques in the schools because it's their schools. They pay, they maintain, they continue after we hand it over to them. So we stopped doing plaques again about a dozen years ago. But we recognize that this is an issue and this is a very important issue and this is why we're trying to get into this. Yeah, I suppose it's not just about the plaque per se. I mean, it's, yes, it's about the, the, the plaque and certain representations made to donors. But equally, I would say the concern stems from representations made to donors that their funding is going to a project and that you're not soliciting the same funding for that for, for that same pro- or different funding for that same project. I, I recognize what you say about Bohr 
yeah. that is required. I, I, I recognize that, you know, there may be additional expenses that require additional funding. May I respond to that? Is that possible? Just because I really... Yeah, yeah, but before you do it, I guess I'm seeking clarity. I, I know, and I appreciate you are concerned with this. I'm seeking clarity for how you are going to get to the bottom of this. That who, who is it you have tasked with getting to the bottom of this? And who is it on the ground that is going to get to the bottom of this for you? I appreciate the question. So just two quick things. Number one, I feel like some people maybe are misunderstanding that, yes, we have funders who fund but that's not just our model. We also program in schools for five, seven, sometimes 10 years. So again, school lunches, teacher training, school supplies, programs for kids, all of that requires incremental funding. That's why people pool their funding into a village project. They pool it to support all these initiatives so that it can support the kids. It's not just building a building. An empty building does no good. You need all the other programs. And to answer your question, we have a standing committee uh, of the board that has now been formed. Uh, publicly, it is a uh, Jerry Connolly, who's the former director of education of the Toronto District School Board, who is going to lead this standing committee and who's looking at this issue, both from Canada and we also have a team in Kenya that is digging into this. It will take a while. This is, you know, a lot of paper records from 15 years ago in Kenya, but we're trying to figure out the answer to this question. But we are committed to finding out the answer to this question because it is important. And we are, I, I, I hear you. And, and I, I, we heard Mr. Cowan. And again, we are not perfect. But in 25 years, thousands of projects, 45 countries, deal with clean water and health, we make mistakes, and, and we apologize for those mistakes. Um, the rest of my time, I cede to Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll make a quick comment. Uh, in the uh, For the witness, in your opening statement, you criticized the government uh, or government members being hiding behind uh, children's charity. Uh, if you check the blues, and I'm a permanent member of this committee, uh, during numerous debates, I point out the uh, the um, the fact that it's unfortunate that many kids will lose the opportunity to uh, participate in the summer internship or, or volunteer program, and uh, the negative impact this um, this whole sort of a political, you know, uh, motivated. Uh, uh, back and forth uh, is has on the chair entire charity uh, charitable industry. So I, I welcome you to check the blues. Um, as you can see today, that uh, you know, uh, Mr. Polyev and and especially the uh, the conservative members uh, is, is having a tough time to uh, to believe that there all the informations are there. Uh, they seem to be uh, very education expedition and they want to continue on um having said that i i respect uh, all members privilege to ask questions yeah, especially point of order mr oppositions Chair. yeah recognizing a point of order is that uh on the floor point yeah of order? I, I just mr no dong, pardon me mr carey yeah mr dong was saying that there's some type of fishing expedition and i think even the kilbergers would agree that their corporate Mr. structure Kerry, is, this is a very point confusing. Of, is this a point of order or is this it's a, not a fishing uh, expedition of, that's okay. well that, that's not a point of order thank you mr Kerry. mr dong i i just want to uh although i disagree with them uh, and i i disagree with uh was their motive too uh i do respect and i would defend their rights as parliamentarians and their privilege uh, and that also their responsibility to to make sure the government is accountable. So with that, I, I have nothing else to ask. I just want to put that on the record. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can we just respond to that quickly? Uh, Mr. Kilbeer. Thank you. Uh, sir, we appreciate the fact that you're defending the members of parliament and we respect the fact that you as members of parliament have a very important role to play. We're just asking as well that people are also defending the kids in the process. Colleagues, we uh, have now reached the end of our rounds of questions. Um, there have been a number of discussions during this hearing with regards to the production of documents. Uh, I, I know that there's been, um, I'm certain that your council has been taking note of those things that have been requested and I'm certain that that uh, will, um, will, will be uh, supplemented by the clarity, clarification that will be provided by committee members over the next uh, number of hours as we, uh, as we, we, uh, 
uh, I guess, go through all of the things that were not only requested, but that you, in fact, have uh, suggested that you would be happy to provide for us. And so we'll we'll look forward to the, that uh, that correspondence. Um, we will we'll ensure that that happens. Uh, not seeing any additional. Uh, oh, I do see that Miss Latanzio does have her hand up. Mr. Miss Latanzio, was that intentional or that was previous? Mr. Dong, I see you physically raising your hand. Were Were you looking to? Uh, Mr. Dong, I'll turn to you if you had a comment. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I, uh, listening to uh, Mr. Polyev uh, uh, mention, or, or you know, um, I take a, a, the threat to our witness that he's going to move a motion. I just want to be clear. Are we considering that motion? Are we not considering that motion? Or that wasn't a formal motion at all? Because I didn't see any motion. I didn't see a notice of motion. I don't know any details. Uh, we'll turn to Mr. Polyev if he does have a motion. Obviously, he, he did. Uh, I'm not uh, inviting him for a motion. I just well, want I, to clear. <laughs> I'm just saying, I just want you to clarify that, you know, I just want to make sure that there's no UC or unanimous consent given to what uh, Mr. Mr. Polyev uh, saying so if there's no motion on the floor i'm happy with that i'm not inviting him to do a motion just just to be clear i'm asking for uh for clarification from the chair i uh i i i i do believe that there was a suggestion that there might be a motion that had been brought forward um there isn't um there is no motion at this point that's being debated if you'd like to you could probably work with mr polyev to draft that uh, motion and we could probably undertake to to vote on that if that's what you'd like but uh the motion i want to put forward is a german of this today's meeting not seeing any additional uh, i understood point of order members? mr chair i understood there Pardon was me. one more round of questioning that had uh, not been completed <sighs> The 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 members that were remained on that on that round had indicated that they were that they were done. Okay, so um, we uh, Mr. C uh, Kerry and I split the last round. And we were going to split the uh, so basically we took our two rounds and split them each in half. So we we had one more to split. That's my that was my understanding of of the. Th there is there is a motion to to adjourn. Yes, I, do not grant, I believe uh, that, that. I know that the liberals are trying to <laughs> run out of the back door as quickly as possible, but uh, no, we don't grant uh, consent for that. Okay, well, it does take unanimous consent to, to adjourn. We'll turn to, uh, um, I'm, I'm assuming then we'll, we'll turn Sorry, to- point of order? Uh, Mr. Angus. Yeah, it's not that I don't want to hear my colleague, Mr. Polyev, again. Uh, we had agreed to 5.30. I think it's fair. Um, I think normally if there's going to be a debate over adjournment, we should actually put it to a vote because some of us actually have to carry on to other uh, parliamentary work now. So- um, you, you are right because it is, uh, it has now, uh, been moved as a motion. It is non-debatable. We'll move to a vote. All those in favor of uh, adjourning, please raise your hand. I, I believe that there are the numbers to adjourn, so we will move to adjourn. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you and to our witnesses. Thank you, Chair, for, for handling this in such a way, and thank you to our witnesses for coming. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. I second that motion.